afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third day of 9 ITB International Geothermal Workshop 2020. Thank you for honorable participants for joining us today. I hope everything goes well with you and your family with this kind of situation lately. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Nurvita Aprilina. I am geologist working for Star Energy Geothermal Indonesia. And currently I'm taking master degree of geothermal engineering in Institute Technology Bandung. And I will be your host for today's occasion. Our annual event is organized by Geothermal Engineering Master Program, Institute Technology Bandung, with a theme titled Advancing the Prospecting and Utilization of National Geothermal Sector Through Best Practice Management, Investment, and Technology. Without forgetting yesterday, the ITB attained one ITB, you made a tremendous journey. This year, even though our annual event has to be conducted in online basis, I believe that everyone is excited as I am to take part in this event. Before we start, we would like to thank our silver sponsors, PT Sustrako Adikreasi, PT Geodipa Energy. We also thank to our bronze sponsors, PT Tunggal Buana Utama, PT Plumpang Raya Anugrah, PT Scientific Drilling, Star Energy Geothermal. And without forgetting our other sponsors, PT Pertamina Geothermal Energy, PT Supreme Energy, PT Sarana Multi Infrastruktur, PT Deptiwangga, Kogindo Daya Bersama, Bank BNI, and PT Andalan Tunas Mandiri. This event is also supported by International Geothermal Association, Indonesia Geothermal Association, Indonesian Association of Geologists. My gratitude also goes to media partner for advertising this important event, Think Geo Energy, Indonesia International Geothermal Convention and Exhibition, Geothermal Resource Council, Madrock Media, Panas Bumi News, Rambu Energy, and Wing Indonesia. More important, this event is free and don't forget to subscribe in our YouTube channel. The link will be provided in the chat box of this Zoom room. Make sure to check your chat box at the end of event to get a free electronic certificate as well. Today, technical session, we're going to have two invited speakers, Bapak Riki Firmanda Ibrahim as the President Director of PT Geodipa Energy and Miss Jane Broderidge from Jacobs, and also other six selected presenters that will present their studies. Today, we have two moderators. First one is Bapak Ali Ashad to lead invited speakers and Bapak Mirzam Abdurrahman to lead technical session. Now, our program is presentation from our invited speaker, which will be delivered by Bapak Riki Firmanda Ibrahim and will be moderated by Bapak Ali Ashad, a lecturer from Geothermal Engineering Master Program. Please welcome Bapak Ali Ashad. The time is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are in a good condition, good health. Welcome to, we will start our activities today, the third day of ITB International Geothermal Workshop. We are very happy here. We are very glad because uh, we have Papa Ricky Firmanda Ibrahim, the President Director of Geodipa Energy, Geodipa Persero, state-owned enterprise under Ministry of Finance. Uh, before we start, I will describe Pak Riki as to have long and broad experience, not only in 
industries, but also in organization. Pak Riki is a board of METI, Indonesia Renewable Energy Society, and also expert in MKI, Indonesia Electricity Society. Pak Riki has accumulated broad extended years professional experience in energy sectors, long experience in geothermal in Amosis, Indonesia. Pak Riki also has a long experience in other companies and also a company in, in oil company uh, and also in petrochemical, uh, which is Tuban Petro or TPPI. Pak Riki hold degree, master degree from Montana Tech University, uh, USA. And uh, we are very happy to have Pak Riki here because Pak Riki is president director for Jodipa and we know Jodipa has very big program. Pak Riki will be here to uh, explain us. It is big but not ambitious. How to make this uh, realistic? Because Jodipa has a program the first one is develop existing asset in Dieng and Patuha, and also how to optimize the existing asset in Dieng and Patuha. And we have to remember that Geodipa has uh, as an agent for geothermal exploration drilling fund implementation, and another another task for Geodipa is. Uh, get assignment from the government of Indonesia for the greenfield. So it is very big uh, job for Jodipa. Uh, and uh, now we, we, we want to uh, give the opportunity for Pak Riki to explain to us whether it is ambitious or not, or realistic, because Geodipa with this big uh, program, uh, we will be very happy because it will become uh, to have an important role for geothermal development in Indonesia. Pariki, we are very sorry because we have very tight schedule and I know you have a tight schedule today. So we have about 20 minutes for you to, uh, to present your, uh, your uh, presentation. Uh, time is yours, Pak Riki. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Pak Professor Ali Saad. My uh, uh, say is a partner. Is also everybody. Selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So good afternoon or good, good night at uh, your countries. Let's start to my presentation today. Pak Ali, is that any something? Uh, present my presentation, please. Yes. Well, this is the uh, title is given to me. You know something? How is the geothermal in Indonesia in the near future and also the future? Let's start to the first uh, uh, slide, please. Next to the slide, please, uh, Ali. Yes. Well, is uh, Geodipa Energy today is a state-owned enterprise. Well, I don't want to uh, explain more about the five my five-year tasks, but I believe that in, in 2021, Jodipa will be ambitious, and I'm sure is uh, uh, all parties ask about the uh, geothermal should be come to the, the Jodipa energy. Next, please. Next, Pali. Yes, but let's say is you know is. Uh, for us, you know, for why is uh, we are here, especially Jodipa? Well, this is especially is to re, uh, re revitalization, re revitalize the asset, which is is Dieng and Patuha, as well as others. Not only that, also participation. How to boot is the uh, geothermal as our national strategic. Uh, energy national strategic in the future. Of course, I will also uh, explain about this, what we are doing 
you know, for the Dieng and Patuha. And I think Pak Ali also mentioned to me that as you write, that now Geodipa is uh, asked also, is uh, not only asked, but is the one of the agent instructed by the government through PTSMI together with PTPAI is a guarantee to do the, what they call it, the risking the exploration. So in the near future, I think soon by 2020, will be do exploration well, not only in Java, but all of in Indonesia. Next, please. Of course, next, please, Pali. Of course, you know, is the state-owned enterprise is not going to be bigger and then control all of them. But we will also invite the participation of the private sector. State-owned enterprise is uh, only as a bridge. We are, have to be unique. We don't control. We believe we don't, uh, we cannot uh, build is a power plant. We, do, we cannot also, not only power plant, we cannot build all of the sector by the state-owned enterprise. We are as the bridging, how to bridge. This is one of the agenda. Now we are working closely with the PLM, how to make it happen through the binary 10 megawatt, for example, as well as Chandra di Mukha 40 megawatt. The negotiation is going on. And then this is, will be joint venture company with the PRN as the pilot project. Next, please, Pali. Pali, next. <laughs> and as you know, you know, is uh, the future, I think, is uh, not only world class company, but it's the stakeholder expect that, uh, you know, the company must, you know, is meet with the beyond compliant, which is, is uh, must not only build the power plant and as uh, well, however, also build the community. This is also part of our strategy and we are ready to that. And again, Geodipa as the state-owned enterprise, we get many is a uh, uh, facility, many is the, uh, not only facility, but is the, uh, something to make it happen as the fiscal tool together with the PT SME, SMI, and PII. Why is that? Because Indonesian government today, through ministers of energy and minerals resources, as well as minister uh, finance, commit with the renewable energy. I will show you later on. Please next. Pali, can you please next uh, slide? Thank you. Well, I will brief a little bit about the challenge and geothermal uh, solution. I think everybody knows, but let me brief a little bit. You know. Next, please. Pali, can you hear my, my voice? Next. Next slide, yeah. No, no, uh, next, uh, before, before that. I'm sorry, probably this is because of the, no, next, uh, before, before that, before that, before, the, yes. This is, this, I think is a good sample. I don't know, yeah, this is a good sample. What is the challenge you know, from this, look at that, something, uh, six challenges of the renewable energy. I don't say this is only for a geothermal, but also this is for renewable energy. I will em emphasize that. Here in Indonesia, there is no, is the company have the five C, which is character, capacity, capital, condition, you know, as well as collateral. You know, is I don't say it's Indonesian's only broker, but this is the fact. We invite, you know, and also we support the national company must take a a big role also in the near future, as well as the uh, offshore company. Next, please. Yeah, I don't, I don't explain the challenges. I think it's, you know, the challenges, but again, 
the challenges can be solved. You know. Well, the geothermal pricing as today, you know, is expected to be competitive. You know, I think since 1970, you know, when I was also in Amosis, I've been also learning how, you know, is the renewable should be uh, competitive. This is the one of the uh, presentation. Why today is, you know, is the uh, government of Indonesia must, you know, is uh, declare that geothermal need at least nine cents, you know, because of again, PLN as the monopoly company, there many is a uh, power plant. The fact is our competition, our competitors, I mean, is the coal, the fossil, yeah. But in other hand, in the small scale, you know, it's also high price because it's small, the resource will be same, the work will also be same. But in this presentation, express that, well, please don't only look at Java and Bali, but we have a Sumatra as well as uh, Indonesia, east of Indonesia. Let's do together with us. Next. Next. Yeah. The pricing. As you know, is uh, why is that the reason Indonesia expect to be seven, uh, nine cent and below should be competitive? Look at back in 1998. At the time, is uh, US dollar is 2,500 rupiah and then became 15,000. And at the time, is uh, uh, as you know that uh, Geodipa is a very sad, you know, I can say it was sad story in Indonesia because of the uh, arbitration. We lose the arbitration. Our partner, our offshore partner, really do not recognize is a real Indonesian that has many potential. And I expect that, you know, in the future, we can do that uh, opportunity. Therefore, Indonesian now, you know, is as the uh, pricing and uh, not as the regulation. The electricity must be uh, declared, not only declared, but supervised by parliament. You know, it's being part of part. Why is five? We pay many US dollar, also carbonas. You know, it's a lot of money. That's also our, not only father money, but our grand grand children money have to pay that the debt. Therefore, you know, is the, the pricing a little bit controlled by the politicians, you know, and then uh, I'm sure is uh, uh, the process is not very long. Is uh, we can also I, I will explain you know that uh, in the near future the price will be also uh, competitive. Next, please. Next, Pali. Well, I don't explain detail about the risk, but as you know that this is the risk. Why is a Geodipa in the near future will be the exploration? And why is the Geodipa will be holding with the state-owned enterprise? But again, this is the characteristic. This is the character geothermal must do in the beginning when it's proven well, the price is competitive. You know, I will explain how much my operation costs in the all everybody, not only Indonesia, in the world. Next, please. Next. As the state on enterprise, you know, I got a mission, you know, from uh, government, the government very ambitious, you know, to develop the geothermal through they call it a special mission vehicle, Geodipa, PTSMI, our, I can say is small Indonesian World Bank, you know, and the third is the guarantee payment, uh, guarantee company, which is PII. We sit down together, we have engagement together, how to not only think, but implement, you know, not only exploration, exploitation as well, and then uh, in the downstream area, how to improve this, a mechanism in order to compete with the current, like I said, is a, a PLM uh, tariff. 
Next, please. In the next uh, presentation, yeah. Look at that, yeah. Here is the government already provide some uh, facilities, yeah. We have uh, many facilities, you know, already introduced and supported by multilateral bank. You know, it's not only uh, Asian Development Bank. Next week, I'm going also declare our loan signing with the uh, ADB, not only DENG2, DENG3, DENG4. This is very ambitious. Not only that, on, only that is a World Bank also supported. Not only is a World Bank, TFW also is, you know, as well as the JICA will also do some, you know, support to uh, geothermal development. You know, I will also explain later on. Please next, Pali next. Yeah, this is another uh, something, a presentation that how is the government provide, already provided the facilities, a tax holidays, for example. Now we can get it 10 years. You know, I think it's 10 years tax holiday, that's enough. It also can be expanded, you know, if they meet with the requirement. You know, the requirement of 5C is important. Is we look for the real, uh, not only investor, but real developers, not a broker. I'm sorry to say that. You know. So the government provided many, you know, is uh, tax value added uh, 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 facilities, also custom facilities. Well, is every everything is you know is supported by the government. In the right hand side is uh, you, you, you may be familiar with J. GUDP and GREM is the program which is for exploration as well as the exploitation. And like I mentioned, we are is together with the special mission vehicle, PT SMI, PT GODPA as the executor, as well as PII as the guarantee uh, government, uh, government. Next, please. Next. Look at that. You know, not only the, the, the figure you have to look at that, but the facilities, the government incentive provided. And I already calculated, you know, how much cent is, uh, can be reduced for the current uh, electricity price. You know. Again, I mean, the government commit, you know, let's think positive. You know, and, and also, uh, please also use this COVID-19 moment this is the right time is to develop a renewable energy. Next, please. Next. Yeah. This is, as you know, that uh, we have a government guarantee, not only through or not only to a state on enterprise, the private sector also, also already given. You know, we have like uh, five projects is given by the government, you know, is a uh, guarantee. Why is that? Because government serious how to do the, the geothermal right now. You know, I don't explain by one by one, but this is very clear. Next, please. Next, Pali. Yeah. This is the time. My recommendation when I ask, when I sit down with the government of Indonesia, I ask, I propose, you know, because it's the government also ask how to make a big step, not only small step, but this big step, you know. This big step through the holding, you know, through the holdings, you know, how to be the establishment, Indonesian, as the geothermal center excellence by 2045, which is 100 years of Indonesian independence. Next, please. Is this clear that the SWOT analysis, you know, and everybody also already clear that the renewable must be do now. We don't wait for the again, I mean waiting, but it have to be to, to be done now. This is the right time. Next. Next, you know, the target also clear, you know. You know, this is the real target by 2025, even though impossible to be meet now, 
but uh, like I said, it, uh, look at it by 2020, 2045, 2050. That is my target. 2025, 23% might be difficult to, to achieve. Yeah. However, you might consider the government put very high is uh, target. Why is that? Because Indonesian support the emission, the reduction of emission. This is important, not only for Indonesia, but also for the world. Next, please. Next, yeah. The slides, you know, also explain, you know, explain that the, 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 the future, the how to develop the economic through the emission reduction. And again, geothermal is the, the key. You know, I think it's the key compared with others, even with gas, for example. You know, I think this is the key. You know, and also this is uh, opportunities. You know. Next, please. The reason to holding again Indonesian Parliament expected you know if this is holding the asset will be bigger the asset can not be sold to you know is others uh, private outside of Indonesia you know but the private sector can be enjoy the uh, beneficial but the asset must be here. I think it's this simple uh, example, Chevron or Amosis at the time. Now they left the company, but they already got some, a lot of beneficial. They, they left, they sold the company, but they still, you know, the operation still going on up to date. Therefore, is the holding is important. Next, please. Next, yes. Holding, of course, will bring many benefit. In the past, the electric sector only meet with the uh, demand, only with the something is the demand growth. You know, if there is no growth, well, of course, if there is no electricity. But if we are holding, because we are a mission, you know, mission of the government as the, uh, the government agency, we have to be unique. So we have to create what we call it demand growth as the demand creation. So we have to create, you know, as a PLM, Pertamina, and Geodipa, if they are one company, similar like uh, Ana Inalum with the Freeport. Of course, we created also not only the growth we concern, yeah, demand growth, but we create the, cre the, create the value through demand creation. You know, this is also another key. Therefore, you know, this uh, holding is important, is have, uh, to be happened. In the near future. Next. Next, please. Another benefit I already mentioned to you is uh, this is a little bit uh, about the nationality, you know. So if we are is uh, holding, of course, is uh, will be beneficial not only for uh, people right now, but for our great great sons, you know. So we can control the asset, but the benefit can be enjoyed not only for the people of Indonesia, but also can be beneficial for the private. They are also uh, uh, as a benefit, you know, to, to join, to develop the asset. Next, please. Another is, uh, you know, benefit I can mention here, but I think is everybody's uh, aware that, you know, well, of course, as the holding the asset will be bigger. So we don't depend on only is the money from the PMN or, or something from the Indonesian pocket, you know, but we can also 
benefit for for uh, put some you know uh, uh, a bigger step, not only small step. You know, benefits to Indonesian government, of course. You know, this is uh, I don't explain one by one, and especially the people of Indonesia, we need to develop. You know, is the economic in the rural. We have to develop the economic development through the electricity sector. They need, uh, you know, is now they cannot go to the school, but they need power. They need electricity. Not only that, they need also is a telephone through the through the communication. The fact is not the, the some of the Indonesian part of Indonesia, they still lack of the uh, communication. The communication need also electricity. Therefore, the, you know, is the holding benefit will be important for Indonesian people. Next, please. Next, yes. Opportunities, you know. Well, I think in the opportunities, I will mention to you that, well, let's forget it about fit in tariff for bigger project. Fit in tariff, let's focus to the small project, 10 megawatt less or five megawatt less. Let's, you know, we together, not only geothermal, together with others, renewable energy sector. We have solar, we have a biomass, we have wind. Let's also, we have also uh, water, you know, I mean, water here is uh, I mean, mini hydro. Let's also do, let's they give it 10 megawatt. That's enough for them. However, for the big like geothermal, you know, must meet through, you know, is something cascade model. Something is something realistic model, competition model. Not only that, you know, is the government considered now, you know, they consider what? They consider incentive to the flow. And the proposal is between two to four cents. However, this incentive is not 30 years. This incentive only 10 years enough you know to recover our debt to the bank not only that you know is we are also is uh, developing a good mechanism now is to invite the manufacturer to indonesia you know similar like turkey did similar like other country did you know they invite manufacturer Indonesia also invite manufacture. You know, this is through Jokowi. If you have a manufacturer to be here Indonesian, okay, please take it and uh, meet with me. So this is another opportunity. And I hope the manufacturer concentrate to Indonesia. Why? We are plenty, Me medium, Enthalpy, we are plen still plenty is uh, uh, high enthalpy. Let's come. Not only that, we are now discussing with PLN, with the government. You know, it's not only 30 years contract. We are, we are also considering two times, like 50 or 60 years contract, in order to reduce the the price, the electric price. Recommendation number two. Please, recommendation number two, please, Pali, yes. Recommendation number two, again, this is about the, about the price. In the near future, I believe that the price is not only discussed by the President's decree. Yeah? The President's decree will not only, again, small thing, because this is the high level. The President's decree will really beneficial for the national net benefit. They will consider something uh, incentive and many is a fiscal. This next. Uh, recommendation number three. Here is, you know, is the reason, you know, why I think I already explained to you is we are, uh, should be holding you know, I think 
uh, again need is very urgent to be holding is uh, many aspect I already discussed before. Next, please. Number four, the tariff. The tariff will be one institution as today is regulated again uh, only by the Minister of uh, Director General of Electricity. You know, they did very good. Yeah, they did is uh, quite is uh, critical and they, they work together with the Minister of Finance. However, it's not transparency. You know, it's not like in uh, others, in the telecommunication, in the tollway, you know, we need also one of the institution, you know, the institution will consider, will provide the formula of the tariff. And the formula also is uh, supported by the government through Indonesian parliament. Next, please. Recommendation number uh, three. The regular uh, the institution is not a new institution. It will be cost, but the institution is still in the Directorate General of Electricity, but on, they only sub, you know, and they only sub of the Directorate General of Electricity. And the members are among the IPP, for example, as well as University and PLN. And, you know, as you know, you know, the PLN, there is uh, in the mind map, Three point here, generation capacity, exp exp uh, expansion planning, for example, they are they have their role, but they are also one of the uh, members. Recommendation number four, if any, please. Next, next, Pali. Okay. The opportunities, COVID nineteen as the momentum. Let's consider and let's positive think positive. You know, and this is the time to rising a renewable energy. We reset the energy uh, policy. You know, not only is a, a cheap price, small price, but the energy must be clean as well sustainable. That is the role. Number three, geodipa development. I will show you what is our development. Next, please. Next, you know, is again like low carbon is the one opportunity in Indonesia now consider in the future how to develop low carbon economic development funding. This is in, in progress. And I believe this is also is going to be supported by a people of the world. You know, is the people of the world now is worry about the increasing temperature. This is a given by the International Geothermal Association. They consider is the increasing of the temperature. Well, let's Indonesian ready to, to, to support that. You know, we have a plenty of a renewable energy. Next, please. Next. For the economic, again, look at that. Renewable energy create a lot of jobs yeah, compared with the fossil. This is, is not uh, uh, written, also is not made by me, but this is by IRENA. You know, IRENA uh, state that this is 75 uh, for the renewable, for example, with the same size, you know, and a lot also for the uh, efficiency, create also many jobs you know, compared. This is, this is a time, don't subsidize the energy. We don't need to subsidy for the energy, but we need subsidy to the people of the, you know, the poor people directly. Next, please. Next. Uh, Geodipa development, for sure, for sure by 2025, we have Dieng number two, Patuha number two, Dieng number three, Dieng number four, and uh, Dieng number five. Being number six, number seven. We are working closely right now. We cannot name it right now, but five projects will be supported by Asian Development Bank. It's already in the pipeline of Asian Development Bank. But another eight, another three projects is uh, participated by private sector. They are also ambitious. 
you know, is private sector, you know, is really is a support not only I don't I don't like the aggressive but ambitious motivation how to create is the project in Indonesia. Next, please. Next, this is uh, I don't have to uh, uh, explain one by one, one one by one, but look at that. This this is only by Jodipa, plenty of location, drilling location, exploration also plenty, you know, up to Jailolo. You know, this is this will be have to be finished, completed by 2023 or 2024. Now, all of also created by Indonesian, young generation, you know, is uh, we have a young generation, very smart, you know, and they work cooperatively with the expert from New Zealand, from Iceland, from Japan, you know, from United States, you know. Well, I, I believe this is not uh, aggressive, but this is ambitious. We are very ambitious and we, we will show you, you know, and we will show you how to get there. Not only how to get there, but we will show you when we finish to be there. Next, please. Next. Your participation, you know, all the students, we are welcome. Up to date, we are welcome to the research, many research, not only from ITB, you know, even private university, we are welcome from Indonesian University, from uh, Gajah Mada, from Semarang, from Purwokerto. We are plenty now. We open. We don't secret. We don't have uh, confidence secret. Yeah. Confidentiality, yes, confidentiality, but we don't have secret. Let's do together, not only for electricity sector, however, for direct use. Let's university, let's student do more research. You know? And we also provide sharing session internally through the uh, university. And today, like I mentioned to you, through a good moment is now it's webinar. We don't have to go there, but let's share session every time. Let's next. Next. This is, I think, my end. Please prepare yourself, you know, for every opportunities because we are growing and let's become our agent of change, promoting the use of renewable energy. Next. Thank you very much. And don't forget, follow Jodipa Instagram, Jodipa Energy. I'm sure you will get you will give you will get a lot of information from us. Thank you very much, and see you again. Thank, Thank you, Pak Riki. Very interesting presentation. We yeah. now come to the uh, question and answer session. We have many questions, but uh, we don't think that we have enough time for to answer all. So we will pick one by one, Pak Riki. Number one, there is yeah. a question from Pak Sugiarto, Pak Sugiarto Citro Atmojo from Inaga. The, yeah. uh, the question basically is asking uh, yeah. targeted megawatt of uh, uh, for Jodipa, let's say simple way is, for example, uh, how many megawatt in 2025 or 2030? That's uh, the question from Pak Sukiyarto. Okay, it's by 2023, you know, Jodipa will be producing 170 megawatt. And then by 2025, another ad is uh, 110 megawatt. So 110, you know, is plus 20, 270. You can count it, you know, is something at least uh, I believe with the ORC 400 megawatt is my hand. By 2030, you know, we commit because it's Yang and Patuha. We are now, we have, we already hold I, uh, uh, purchase power agreement or energy sales contract with PRN for 400 megawatt. Yang 400 megawatt, Patuha 400 megawatt. We don't only concentrate on the Chiwede, 
we will go to the Chibu, uh, we will go to the Chimangu, you know, it's to the to the future. So by 2030, hopefully something 800 megawatt. But again, before that, you know, I think the transition will be holding. Yudipa, uh, PGE, and PLN will be holding, and then again, I think we have a, a big uh, asset on this. Okay. We hear, Thank you. We hear, yeah. Pak Ali, we hear is not Jodipa, uh, yeah. We hear is as Indonesia. Okay. Actually, Pak Sugiarto also asking about the uh, how to implement the target, but I think you already described quite yeah, uh, clearly okay. in this uh, in this uh, presentation. Okay. The second question from Pak Nur Khairi Amin from Neo Kemi. How okay. is the the influence and effort of Jodipa as a role model of Indonesian local government geothermal to make it the electrical price to be competitive. I am quite sure you also already mentioned, but maybe you can uh, repeat a little uh, short uh, in short uh, way. Yeah. Yeah, Pak Ali. I think Pak Ali also already helped yesterday. So, you know, the first thing, now we are engaging joint venture with PLN. In the past is all of the, how do I say, uh, audit is post audit, but today there's no post audit. We have to audit in the beginning. We have to commit, you know, as the open book. That's is good. Thank you, Pali. You remind me. That is how to make it happen. The second, like we have, we, we say that. We don't only concentrate on the demand growth, but we have to also work on the demand creation. How to can play the demand creation without PLN? PLN is the Indonesian electricity sector, the only one. Yeah? We cannot avoid this PLN. You know, PLN is the big company as well as Pertamina. You know? Again, this is in, in our undang-undang, in under our uh, law. You know, they are as a big company, and that can be cannot be sold. They must, you know, is control is the price. Therefore, we have to work together. You know, we have to relocate or invite the manufacturer here. You know, many work here. The plenty we have at least is, you know, the uh, the geologists say to me is. 25 gigawatt electricity equivalent, yeah? equivalent 25 gigawatt electricity. Wow, well, that's a lot. Say I don't, I don't dream 25 gigawatt electricity. Say 50 percent. And again, the medium temperature. A lot of organic cracking cycle company. Many, you know, is opportunity here. I hope this is clear. Okay, thank you, Pak Ricky. The third question, I think this is the last question. Uh, basically, because you mentioned about, you promote uh, the holding geothermal company from different uh, company, uh, state companies, which is maybe it will raise some worry from the uh, foreign uh, investors. What do you think about this? The Why question is, is from Pak, Pak Julfi Sianturi, PHM. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mind the name. But why is worry with me? I'm born here. You know, I'm born here. Is uh, my my parents also is a military. You know, is uh, he passed away and is is a graveyard in the Taman Pahlawan. You know, why is there worry? You know, we are as the state-owned enterprise. We don't compete private sector, please. Don't be negative. You know, state-owned enterprise as the bridge must a unique company, must be unique company, only as a bridge. Yeah. Indonesia, especially Jokowi, mentioned many times in the meeting through Minister of Finance, Minister of Finance also remind me, state-owned enterprise must be unique. That's important. And we don't really create many a project for ourselves, but we are inviting private sector to reduce the risk and then invite the 
private sector. So we are inviting uh, many uh, private sector, you know, and let's we work for the risk. We we do for the risk. The government do for the risk, and we invite. This is a simple, uh, simple. I think this is not complicated uh, statement. I think, and then don't don't think the negative. You have to bring your positive and optimism. This is the right time. I say to you. How many is people now? I am, you know, the student, a new student in in in, in my building now. You know, is uh, you can ask also is uh, uh, private sector from West Jack, from Iceland. You know, I created a lot of work here. Yeah, okay. uh, Jack. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very clear that uh, you. Um, uh, 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 I think there is no no reason to be worried because the government yes. has uh, the, uh, the the government is want to make uh, the uh, friendly uh, uh, climate for the investment not to make uh, not to close all opportunity. So the the the, uh, the government will more like uh, put the position to be in the risky uh, business. But uh, yes. later, and then will be open for everybody for any sectors. Yes. Okay. Similar like how, similar like how way, you know, it's uh, impossible to invite the private today. You know. But again, I'm okay. the state of yeah. the press on the unit. Thank you very much. Please. Okay, Pariki. Uh, for the other question, we we are very sorry. Uh, there is a question from Pak Fernando, but unfortunately, we have uh, limited time and. Maybe it is not the last uh, opportunity. We will have a continuous program, different program. So we will uh, meet again uh, in the other uh, occasion. Okay, again, thank you, Pariki, uh, all the participants uh, for the very interesting discussion today. And I will return uh, this uh, to the uh, MC, Mbak Vita. Okay, Mbak Vita. Thank you, Bapak Riki Ibrahim and Bapak Ali Ashad. Before we start the next technical session, we will have a photo session for all panelists and speakers of the day. Kindly activate your video to Bapak Riki Ibrahim, Bapak Ali Ashad, Bapak Mirzam Abdurrahman, Mas Drestanta Yuda, Mr. Nyora Donald, Mbak Rindu Graha Bakti Intani, Mas Sabto Trianggo, Mas Muhammad Hasbi, and Mas Fanji Putra. Please be ready. I will start the countdown. Three, two, one, and smile. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, moving right along, our session now is technical paper presentation that will be moderated by Bapak Mirzam Abdurrahman. Bapak Mirzam Abdurrahman is lecturer at Department of Geology, Faculty of Earth Science and Technology, Institute Technology Bandung. He accomplished bachelor degree in ITB, obtained master degree in ITB, and doctoral degree from Akita University, Japan. Previously, he worked for several universities in Indonesia, Australia, Japan, UK, and Denmark. He also an active author of the conversation and National Geographic. Please welcome Bapak Mirzam, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Bu Vita, for introducing me. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mirjan. I will be your moderator for technical session. Before we start, uh, let me share an announcement about the guidelines and important information regarding the event. Uh, first one, please ensure your internet connection is stable. And then this event will be live through Zoom webinar and also from YouTube channel. You can follow from Geothermal ITV YouTube channel. And then this event will be conducted through four days until tomorrow. Until August the 13th. 
And then all the materials of the paper can be accessed through the W slash workshop 2020. And then the link for the certificate will be shared to you at the end of the day. Okay, next we will start the technical session presentation. Uh, there will be uh, six paper will be presented today and then plus one from invited speaker. Uh, the speaker for technical session are Pak Destanta Yuda from Serula Operation LTD. And then the second, Ibu Rindu Gerha Intani from Geothermal Master Program ITB. Uh, the third, Pak Muhammad Hasbi from Geothermal Master Program ITB. The fourth, Pak Nyora Dona from Geothermal Master Program ITB. The fifth, Pak Sabto Triango from Pertamina Geothermal Energy and also for from Geothermal Master Program. And then the last, Pak Fanji Juanda, Pak Fanji Junanda Putra from Star Energy Geosalak LTD. And then the invited speaker is Chen Broderich from Jakob. Uh, its presenter will have around 15 minutes for presentation and then three minutes for question and answer. And then as already mentioned in the uh, Zoom chat, that the question from the audience, you can you should follow the, the format like the name under, underscore institution slash uh, or affiliation and then underscore question. Due to the limitation, we will select only three questions and try to in, trying to continue to the remaining if the time is adequate. With the further ado, please welcome the first presenter, Pa Drestanta Yuda from Sarula. LTD. Okay. I also remind that there will be a momento for you and your team as a token of appreciation. The committee will contact you regarding the shipping address. Pa Desanta Yuda, time is yours. Hello everyone. I hope you are well, staying healthy during this challenging time of navigating coronavirus pandemic. My name is Yuda. I'm a geologist who currently working in Sarula Operation Limited, together with other co-authors, Ibu Suryantini and Pak Dodi Astra, we published the study result about geology assessment of permeability distribution in Selangkitang Geothermal Field, North Sumatra, Indonesia. So today in this live technical session, I would like to deliver our study result. As you may know, the Silangkitang Geothermal Field is located in the Tapanuli Utara District, the North Sumatra Province, Indonesia. The field is located approximately 35 kilometers southeast of the town of Tarutung. The Silangkitang is one of several prospects in the Sarula contract area. Sarula Operation Limited, or SOL, is a consortium of Medco, Itochu, Kyusu, Ormat, and intact that has been granted the right to utilize the Sarula geothermal resource for power generation under the framework of joint operating contract or GOC with Pertamina. Selangkitang start commercial generation of 110 megawatt on March 18, 2017. Currently, SOL has three units commercial running at Namora Ilangit 220 megawatts and Silangkitang 110 megawatts under a single contract. At SIL, there are four production wells drilled in SIL 1 pad and nine injection wells drilled in SIL 2 and SIL 3 pad to support the full power generation. The SIL structural map was further refined using high-resolution aerial photos and satellite imagery and LiDAR data that were acquired in 2015. The most prominent features in LiDAR that could be easily identified are some northwest and southeast trending scarps crossing the entire SIL area. The principal dextra the principal dextral strike slip strand of the Great Sumatran Fault, the Tor Sibohi Fault, is easily observed as a northwest southeast trending break in a slope with the dextral offset in the streams. 
some wells including a new drill well penetrated basement after intersected this main fault at depth confirming major offset of basement rock across the structure the band of this fault was observed and it could be divided into three sections south of seal tree the fault strike between the north 30 wells and north 40 wells indicated by the red line for a distance of about 7.25 kilometers along the fault north and northwest of seal 3 to seal 2 the fault strike between the north 37 west and north 45 west indicated by the green line the north of this point the strike of the fault is between north 20 west and north 32 west indicated by the blue line the great sumatran fault strand which parallel to torsi bohemian fault bonded the sarula graben with the paleozoic meta sediment at the eastern portions this fault is referred as a east torsi bohi fault the basement was encountered at the shallow depth and was interpreted as a result of uplifting along the Barisan Mountain. The western boundary of Sarula Graben in Sil was indicated by the less distinct western strand, namely the Hutajulu Fault, located 4 to 6 kilometers southwest of the eastern fault trace. Although not as clearly defined, this trend could be observed on the LiDAR according to the different surface textures and the color. The bogey gravity anomaly also corresponds with northwest southeast lineament that coincide with this fault strand. Another important lineament, namely the West Torsibohi fault, was interpreted to the west of the main. Torsi Bohi Fault, which has variety of strike ranging from north 45 west to north 5 west. The fault seems to be separated from the principal strain at the north area where there was a north south narrow valley and it joined again 3 km south is from the southmost bicarbonate springs. The geomorphologic feature of this fault was less evidence near the seal 2 and seal 3 pad area. Based on the drilling result at seal 3 well, the daysite tau within the Sarula Graben formation may show offset because of this particular fault movement. This West Torsibohi fault and the main Torsi Bohi fault created a lens zone where the fumaroles nearby the seal one pad were exposed. On the map view, it can be clearly seen that the shape of this area becoming narrow at the southern area of seal, all production well and most injection wells drill within this area. For descriptive purposes, this zone is referred to as a sweet spot in the next couple slide. A 50 feet interval of acoustic image data was acquired from a well drill at seal one path to the west, indicated by the yellow star in the map. In general, the acoustic image showed massive tough texture, which is probably part of Sarula Graben formation. Fractures were only observed in a thin interval from 3350 feet to 3380 feet, and this might correspond with the less significant total loss circulation at 3358 feet. About six open fractures identify strike ranging from north 140 east to 160 east and dipping range of 72 to 76 degree. This fracture may correlate with the subsurface parallel subsidiary strands of the main Torsibohi fault that was not identified from the surface expressions. One of the fractures with a relatively large aperture about 2 feet was identified at a depth of 3358 feet. 
However, the well drilled in these portions showed below average permeability, indicating that although some of the open fracture were identified, there was a possibility that these voids were filled partially by secondary minerals or the fracture were not well connected to higher permeability reservoir fractures. Here is some shallow thin sections from seal one well that drill to outflow directions. So the sample uh, at 13, 10 feet show the low to medium altered endocytic lava with the plagioclast, were plagioclast. A small amount of hydrothermal clay replaced the plagioclast phenocris in endocyte lava. In a deeper samples, the sedimentary rock with the abundant quartz was identified together with the dacite lava contained plagioclast and quartz at 1730 feet. All samples show that chips are in a low to medium degree of hydrothermal alterations. Evaluations on shallow thin sections from seal one well that drill to outflow direction indicated that the rock has low to medium intensity of the hydrothermal alterations. This slide showing the fluid inclusion analysis. Higher measured temperatures than the fluid inclusions temperatures was observed in a three fluid inclusion samples from one well drill at seal one pad where the upflow of seal geothermal system was interpreted. Each well drill at seal two and seal three which penetrated the sweet spot indicated the measure temperature closely matches with the temperature when the mineral were formed. In the same well, but at a shallower level, the fluid inclusion yield higher temperatures than measured, signifying that cooling occurred after the faint minerals were deposited. And the seal too is, there's an indications that the samples located at or near the argillic clay rich layer and within the sweet spot, which may be exposed to surface groundwater. The other interesting fact that the sample at sultry locations outside the sweet spot uh, and the below the top of reservoir showed the evidence of cooling mineral depositions. Within the sweet spot, all the sample of fluid inclusions, the temperatures agree with the recent measure temperature while the outside sweet spot samples showing the cooling process. This slide showing the oxygen isotope interpretations. So in most geothermal system, high temperatures, more than 150 degrees C, the water rock exchange will result in decrease in the oxygen isotope values of the rock. Increasing temperatures and water rock ratio will magnify the extent of the oxygen isotope depletions in the house rock. The oxygen isotope composition in the rock in Silangkitang decrease with a depth to minimum value ranging from 0.7 to 4.4 per mil in four wells within the sweet spot. No additional data of rock oxygen isotope from newly drilled wells. However, some fluid from newly drilled well were sampled and analyzed in terms of the oxygen isotope. The impact to the geothermal fluid due to the water rock interaction will be the other way around. The fluid from the newly drilled wells indicated the presence of relatively lighter oxygen isotope in the fluid samples within the sweet spot, suggested although the exchange of oxygen isotope with the rock was intense, there was mixing with other fluid contains low oxygen isotope that contribute to reduce the oxygen isotope in the fluid. The fluid sample from the well located inside the sweet spot demonstrate heavier in the oxygen isotope as compared with the fluid sample at the margin and the outside of the sweet spot. This result showing that the geothermal activity was concentrated within the sweet spot area where the exchange of oxygen isotope from the rock to fluid is more intense. And this is my last slide.
So the recent geology evaluation in seal indicated that the main strain of Great Sumatran Fault play important role to define the good permeability at Silangkitang. The productivity test result from newly drilled well suggested that the aerial extent of potentially good permeability zone in the Silangkitang geothermal system is restricted to the area marked by the fumaroles between the Torsibohi Fault and West Torsibohi Fault. The high temperature thermal features of the seal area are concentrated in the area of releasing step in the Sumatran Fault system along the western portions of the Torsibohi Fault. As the result of the strike slip fault becomes oblique to regional slip factor, the local extension zone was formed between two segments of the strike slip fault overlap. The strike slip fault and any connected normal fault build a link zones of fracture reservoir. These reservoirs are possibly to be strongly anisotropic with a major fluid flow occurring along the faults and linked fault fractures. Individual fault of this system area acting as the main vertical conduit for the fluids. The association with the fault suggests the heat source in this prospect is the fault array allow deep the, allows the deep circulations and a heating of the waters in the regions with abnormally high geothermal gradient pressures. A series of fractures define fault zone in at least 500 meters to 1.5 kilometer wide in this area, indicating that subslip may be transferred from main Torsibohi fault to subsidiary fault. The possibility of good permeability reservoir to the east of Torsibohi fault or in between Torsibohi fault and east Torsibohi fault is low since the last fracture basement was encountered at a shallow depth and volcanic rock may be deposited at a shallow level where the clay cap was formed. Furthermore, the thermal features were hardly found in this block. The three newly drilled wells from Sil 1 and Sil 3 pad, which penetrated to the west of West Torsibohi Fault, obtained the sub-commercial permeability showed by a limited injection capacity. I think that's all and thank you. Thank you very much, Pa Destanta, for your very good presentation. Uh, okay, the audience, is there any question, please? Okay, uh, Pak Distanta, uh, there is one question from RVID from Supreme Energy. Uh, the question is, uh, how you compare the oxygen isotope? Is the sample from the whole sample or the bulk sample from the shot production? Okay, Pak Distanta. Uh, can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, yes. Hello? Oh, okay. Uh... So the data of a stable isotope in uh, Silangkitang geothermal field divided into two. The first one is the stable isotope uh, that measured from the rock and the other uh, measured uh, in the fluid, uh, geothermal fluid. The exploration well that drilled by the UNOCO uh, measured the, the stable isotope and uh, it was measured from the rock if the water interaction uh, is so intense, so there's a decreasing of the stable isotope uh, in the rock. However, in the development well, we don't have the data of st stable isotope in the rock. So what we uh, utilize uh, in this uh, particular study is the stable isotope that came from the total discharge uh, fluid uh, from the well. And uh, the, the implications of the stable isotope is the other way around. So if the water interactions uh, between rock and the fluid is intense, so the, the concentrations of the oxygen isotope uh, will be increased in the fluid. 
Mm. Okay, thank you, Pad. Thank you for your thank you for your answer. Is there any question from other audience? Maybe if there is no question, my uh, I, have, I have one question for the standard. Uh, this is very interesting thing you mentioned that uh, uh, the, the tectonic setting of Sumatra strongly control the distribution of open fracture because we know that the Sumatra is complex system compared to, to Java. But we know that uh, Sumatra Island, uh, the Sumatra Island uh, have experienced several tectonic uh, events from from the past until the recent day. So, do you think that the this tectonic event also control the distribution for the for the pathway or for the permeability zone, something like that? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I try to uh, answer this question. So, basically, mm -hmm. uh, the Great Sumatran Fault is postulated to be active uh, within mid Miocene, uh, mm -hmm. when the Mentawai uh, spreading uh, floor uh, opening uh, in the northern part of the Sumatra. And uh, the 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 interactions uh, be between the main of the Great Sumatran Fault and also the the subsidiary fault in the western part of the uh, this main fault create uh, extensional uh, structures. So the Great Sumatran Fault is segmented uh, along the Sumatra. Uh, in some place, it creates the Boulevard basins. Some creates the step over, and some uh, creates the jokes. Currently, what we interpret based on our available data, which is the LIDAR data, we haven't uh, conducted the ground check uh, in the field, and this is uh, in our uh, list already. And we interpret that the extensional structures that uh, we found in Silangkitan correlate with the releasing band or the step over uh, uh, between the main uh, Torsi Bohi fault and also the West uh, Torsi Bohi fault. Okay, thank you, Pa Destanta. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your great presenter. Please give a round of applause for the presenter. Thank you. Okay, before we continue uh, to the next uh, to the second presenter, there will be a video from our sponsor. Geothermal energy is a relatively environmentally friendly source of energy. It is Geothermal energy is a relatively environmentally friendly source of energy. It is derived from the heat of the earth. In recent years, the market for geothermal power has increased sharply, especially in emerging markets due to the economic growth due to the growing number of communities in low-income rural areas that have access to the power grid. Any governments are also increasing focus to reduce the dependency on expensive fossil fuels and not environmentally friendly. Sistraco Group is a company engaged in the energy sector. Established in 1995, Sistraco Group is currently very focused to be able to develop and serve you in various needs related to the geothermal sector, which among of them are, whole cleaning services. Sistraco Group provides comprehensive conventional fishing tools and systems include packer milling and retrieving, internal and external cutting, internal and external engagement, washover, basically every fishing application. Regardless of what's in your well, hence are we've removed it successfully. We also provide a radial cutting torch that is safe and without any explosives or harmful chemical elements that can cut the tubular drilling equipment left in the well. As well, biochemical that can scale control, corrosion control, cooling water treatment and also as a rig washer. Downhole camera. Leveraging the advancement of technology today, Sistraco Group also provides high-resolution downhole camera equipment and clear image quality and capable of operating up to a depth of 2,000 meters, adding to our line of services to focus on the development of the geothermal sector. Geothermal Well Testing 
Energy Mega Perseta as the sister company of Sistrico Group also provides the services of geothermal well testing, real-time well monitoring, geoscience, digital remote sensing use sniffer 4D drone. Digital remote sensing system has an advanced capability to detect and map for the following energy sector applications, steam surface breakout monitoring, well reliability and integrity monitoring, air quality mapping, well surveillance and inactive well management, geothermal associated gases detector and mapping. All of which are focused to support activities in the geothermal sector. Please, do not hesitate to contact us when you need our support, because we are there for our common progress. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the video from our sponsor. And then now we are going to the second presenter. The second presenter is Ibu Lindu Gra Intani from Geothermal Master Program ITB. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rindu Brahbakti Intani. I'm geologist for Star Energy Geothermal Darajat. So currently I'm taking the master degree at Geothermal Engineering in ITB. So thank you for the ITB International Geothermal Workshop 2020 to give me an opportunity for me to present my paper. So my paper actually is entitled the uh, updated geology structures and stratigraphy of the Darajat geothermal field. So I would like to acknowledge my co-author Satria Wijaksono and Pak Glenn Goya from Star Energy and also my lecturer Ibu Suryantini. So this is my outline for this presentation. So I will start with the introduction. And then I will uh, show you the background and objective of this study. And then I will share the Daraja surface geology. And then I'll continue to update the Daraja surface geology, including the correlation between surface and subsurface, and also the update structures data that we have. And I will share the geological history and then I will close with the summary. The background why we did this study because we have uh, several new team section and license from the new world world and then we also have the uh, we need to do the database key KC, and then we have the unintegrated interpretation of the stratigraphy and the alteration and we also had the mismatch between the lithology and the formation for example so for the uh, cutting it say that the anusite lava but after we did the analysis for the petrography seems like it is the intrusion and the object is why we did the study because we need to revisit all the, the data of the stratigraphy and all the thermaltration at Rajat. We also need to update our database, including the megascopic description of core and cutting and then photography analysis, metal blue, gamma ray log, and also the image log. We also need to rewind the subsurface stratigraphy in order to alteration of each well in Darajat. We develop the cross section and then the do the correlation of the surface and then the subsurface. We did this data to validate our conceptual model and then we need to update also the static model after we had the result. So the Darajat the geothermal field, as we know, it's located in the West Java. It's about 200 kilometer, kilometer south is from Jakarta. And currently is the largest steam dominated geothermal system with 271 megawatt. So it's located uh, close to Wayang Windu in the west and also the Kamojang in the northern part. So for the slide is showing the location map um, so we have about 49 wells so 
with additional uh, five wells from the newly drilled well. And we also have 29 wells with the borehole image lock. And we have the six limb hole continuous core. And we have, uh, we do the thin section analysis about 500 and for the XRD about 200 data. And we also have the XRF. Um, so we did some cross-section and also the correlation uh, with uh, about uh, 20 cross-section that we did. So we update the surface geology interpretation. So we did our mapping actually in 2010. So at the time we uh, differentiate the lithology unit from the volcanic centers. So we also see the um, pattern of the drainage uh, trend and then we divided some lithology in it using the volcanic stratigraphy. So we, for example, we have the condemned volcanics in the southern part and then we believe that there is a post condemned volcanics but it's not show in the surface after that uh, it's, there is a big eruption that also deposit the Gaga volcanics in the central and then there's also post Gaga volcanics um, we believe uh, there is a trend to the northeast area and then the the youngest one there is the chemist obsidian in the northeast so as you see here in the right map actually there is a map showing the Kendal fault it's really obvious it's extend from the Rajat until Kamojang. And we also have another prominent fault, which is the Gaga fault. And then we believe there is the sector color, which is the Chiakut fault. We also try to uh, see the age dating, but uh, only Kiamis obsidian with uh, 171K um, from the age dating, the potassium argon. Uh, for the rest of the other lithology in it, actually, we have difficulties since the result is unreliable. So from the regional map, we believe that the post condemned volcanics and the condemned volcanic is related with the Pleistocene, similar with the Formas Besser from the Azwar um, map of Garut and Pamelpuk. And then the, the rest, uh, it's uh, the Rakuta until the Kiamis, this is the Pleistocene. There's also the Cryptodome, so we believe there is a Dasit Dome here in the west of the Rajat. And then the youngest one is the Kiamis Obsidian, this is the Rheolithic Dome uh, in the northeast part. So we did the update the unit interpretation for the subsurface geology. So we use the geolog software for doing this analysis. We see that uh, the in the Rajat, we unfortunately we don't have the marker as we see in the other star energy field, uh, for example, Salak. So here we don't really see any markers that really distributed all over the field. So we try to look at the gamma ray data from the um, open hole and also the case hole gamma ray. But uh, in terms of the trend, we didn't really see any spike of a certain lithology unit. That's why here we just look at the dominant lithology for identifying the units. For example, these the A units here in the below part because it has a lot of I mean the thick pyroclastics in the with uh, the lava flows. And then for the unit B, we see that the thick lava flows uh, has also encountered by in, I mean, some intrusion penetrated this A and also B. And then the, there is an imaginary line. It's the even one that we believe that there is the catastrophic event in the Raja that causes um, the depressure rise of the field. And although there is a big, uh, maybe the big eruption, and also there is an erosional surface that shows above the subvolcanic rock, there is a thin layer of the tip, uh, the pyroclastic and also the lava. And we also see the rhyolitic top, as I already mentioned, in the northeast part of the Rajat, we call it as the F unit. 
We also found the death site, uh, which is located in the uh, western part of the region. We tried to correlate between the subsurface and the surface lithology. So in the uh, below part, the subvolcanic sub rock uh, consists of this unit A and B, which correlate with the Kendal volcanics. And then there is the imaginary line, as I already mentioned. This is the Evo one that uh, we believe there is a, a big um, a catastrophic event. And then the deposit, the after that, I was deposited the C unit that may correlate with the post condom volcanics. And after that, there is the uh, Rakutak pyroclastic in the surface, but unfortunately, we didn't encounter in the uh, in the subsurface. And then after that, it's deposited the Gaga volcanics, which correlate with the unit D. And then the post Gaga volcanics, the, the vine pyroclastic is correlate with the E. Um, we also tried to analyze the bedding that we found in the each um, unit of the tuff, and then we could differentiate uh, each unit by also looking at the bedding orientation and also the dipping. For the desert lithodomes that we found in the western part, uh, it's um, just parasitic cones that we usually see in the volcanics. And then there's the Kiamis volcanics in the youngest one. So this is just a cartoon showing the Awara Sapuar actually composed of the A and B units and then intruded by this micro diorite. Okay, and next, so the other finding that we also see from the study is the structural because we um, actually in the beginning, we are dealing with the difficulties in volcanic. We cannot run the uh, seismic. That's why we try to do this stratigraphy evolution to also see if there is any displacement that may support the evidence of the structure or the fault in the region. So there are three observed of major fault, which is the first one is Kendang, and then the Gagak, and also the Chiaput fault. So we could see from the image log that the Kendang fault it correlates with the dipping about 69 to 71, and also from the course data it shows there is a silicon side with the 70 degree um, um, silicon side, and also the sub horizontal and sub vertical fractures. For the Gaga fault, actually, it's obvious from the lidar, possibly dipping southeast, but uh, we also see some displacement in stratigraphic cross section and correlation. For the Chiakut, actually, this is the sector collapse that we believe it's uh, also observed from the lidar, so it's uh, also showing the displacement about uh, 500 meters. So this is the update geology structures, only the obvious one we really called as the major fault. There is Kendanga and Chiakot. We also see other parameters that may support this uh, fault uh, axis. So we try to um, define some chronology or the history of this um, volcanics in Darajat. So we believe um, there is the Kendal fault, which may be tertiary rock. Um, and then there is the uh, erupted of this Kendal volcano. And then um, the Kendal volcano is deposited. And after that, we believe that there is the old sector collapse that may uh, impact it on the, this Kendal volcano. And after that, we believe there is the post Kendal volcanics, of course, and uh, there is a big uh, eruption of the Gaga volcano in the central. Um, mostly is lava, and then there is also the fault of the Chiaco that we believe as the sector collapse that may impact it to this Gaga volcano. This is uh, uh, the Gaga volcano interpreted the uh, form from the Kendal caldera because the resurgent volcanism, similar to the Kendal volcano, the Gaga volcano also erupted the uh, experience the sector collapse and show some patterns in the Easter region. So after that, there is the post Gaga volcanics, and for the last stage of volcanism, there is the um, the Kamis obsidian rolitic and also the Dacite cryptodome or the parasitic cone in the western part of the Rajat. So this is how we uh, 
define our historology, uh, history or the chronology of the Raja. For the summary, we simplify the Raja Jatamar Zafar into seven lithology units and initially um, volcanostratigraphy has been developed by is but it's complicated and we did uh, some edge dating but uh, it's unreliable so that's why we still need to require any edge dating and then for the structures the canal fault is really obvious from the lidar and interpreted that tips is 70 turkey from the image logs and also there is other major fault uh, it's gagak and chiakut uh, um, for updating our current understanding of the raja jatamara sarkwar so I think that's all my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Please, if you have any question, um, recommendation, please. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bu Indu Gaha Intani, for a very nice presentation. Uh, now uh, we are in the question and association. There is one. There is one question already from. Burindu is here? Yes. From, okay, from Ivan Budiman, University of Cendrawasi, uh, Papua. The question is, is there any update on the stratigraphy of the recently drilled from uh, 2019 until 2020 drilling project? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the uh, questions. So actually, we just... Uh, um, completed our drilling campaign of 2019 and 2020 in uh, around March. That's why we already have uh, the description of the cuttings and some of the thin section analysis from those five wells. Um, in terms of the stratigraphy, actually, uh, it has similar uh, distribution unit with our current mm. uh, interpretation. But uh, for the top of reservoir, um, there is some a um, little bit uh, call it, updated uh, following. Uh, it's not really the, because uh, the location of the new newly drilled well actually in the uh, near the boundary in the north, but actually the TOR is still following uh, the central. I mean, it's following the path 20, which is close to the uh, upflow area in Darajat. That's for the stratigraphy. And then for mm -hmm. the alteration, um, mostly similar but uh, actually we didn't see any um, acid advanced argillic because in the, the near uh, the path as far if we uh, remember so in Darajat there is path 20 and path as far in path 20 we found any advanced argillic in the shallow part but for the new path we didn't really see it I think that's much for the answer thank you mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Bu Rindu, for the for the answer. So it means that your previous uh, model is, is is quite good. So you are quite confident to use your previous model, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. And then the next question, Bu Rindu, from Beta ITB. Uh, yeah. She said that what is what is going to rule in the Rajat Jyotirma system? Yeah. Okay, so initially, uh, Kendang Fault uh, is a boundary of the uh, geothermal system in Darajat. But after we do the analysis, I mean, we revisit our image logs and also the cores and others, we think that the dipping of the canal fault is 70 degrees to the southeast, right? So there's also mm. some fractures that may associate it with the uh, canal fault. So uh, we still think that uh, we still need to do the further analysis actually um, for the role of the canal fault, but uh, it may change our maybe our conceptual model. But so far we still uh, believe that the canal maybe it's near the boundary. And then the other uh, the other thing probably the canal also uh, is a pathway for uh, forming the intrusion in Darajat. So our intrusion mm -hmm. is has north-south trending, so it's following the candle pole. Yeah. Oh, oh, really, very, very interesting. So it yeah. means uh, uh, in the near future, maybe you will go to Papandayan as well, right? Because yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, <laughs> part of that fault. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you, Mbak Beta, for the question. OK. Uh, the third question, uh, maybe the, this is the last question, because our time is very limited, from 
Pak Fernando Pasaribu from okay. Amina Geotrama Energy. What is the strategy? What is the strategy for the field expansion of the Rajat field in the future? Any okay, idea? Thank, <laughs> thank you, Bang Fernando. So hmm. actually, we already um, tried to drilling to the northwest area by drilling uh, the recent well, but uh, seems like the geophysics, the, the new interpretation from geophysics also say that probably uh, that's a dipping clay cap there. I mean, steeply dipping of the clay cap. That's why we we mm -hmm. have uh, the uh, other area, which is in the east area that have undrilled regions. So we believe there's some permeability, we still have permeability in the eastern part. Yeah, but we haven't tried to drill as well in the northeast and also the, the east. But we will stop probably to drill to the northwest because we already had the result from the, uh, so far from the last, well, that we drill to the north, uh, to the southwest actually. Mm -hmm. Northwest from the the northern, the northern part of the region. <laughs> so I, I cannot uh, show the map, but uh, I hope Bang Fernando still remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So if you are not going to the east, we are going to the south. Oh huh? uh, no no, the south is our condensation cell, uh, uh, magnetism. So uh, okay. we believe our sweet spot area is still in the north and some okay. in the west. Yeah, but we don't have any data in the in the east, right? So perhaps oh, we still have okay. any data, I mean, any permeability there. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mulindu. Yeah. For, for the answer. Once again, this is very, very quick presentation. Please uh, give yeah, close like. for the uh, presenter, Mulindu Braha Intani. Yeah. Thank you. Then before we continue, there will be a video from our sponsor. Please enjoy. Indonesia merupakan salah satu negara yang memiliki potensi energi panas bumi terbesar di dunia. Saat ini, Indonesia menduduki peringkat dua dunia sebagai negara penghasil listrik dari energi panas bumi. Selain sebagai energi yang bersih dan berkelanjutan, peran energi panas bumi sebagai base load penyediaan listrik menjadi pertimbangan utama agar pengembangannya diprioritaskan. Oleh karena itu, dalam menjaga ketahanan energi suatu negara, energi panas bumi dapat menjadi andalan untuk memasok listrik guna memenuhi target bauran energi 23% EBT di tahun 2025, sesuai dengan amanat dari kebijakan energi nasional. Untuk memenuhi pencapaian target EBT, dalam bauran energi tersebut, Indonesia layak melakukan percepatan pembangunan proyek PLTP di Indonesia. PT Geodipa Energi Persero adalah perusahaan yang bergerak di bidang energi panas bumi mulai dari eksplorasi hingga eksploitasi. Perusahaan didirikan pada tanggal 5 Juli tahun 2002. Kemudian pada tahun 2011, melalui peraturan pemerintah nomor 62 tahun 2011, Geodipa ditetapkan sebagai persero yang pengawasan dan pembinaannya berada di bawah Kementerian Keuangan dan PT PLN Persero. Yang juga merupakan salah satu Special Mission Vehicle atau SMV di bawah Kementerian Keuangan dengan misi mendukung program pemerintah dalam penyediaan listrik tenaga panas bumi yang aman dan ramah lingkungan, serta memberikan manfaat besar kepada Indonesia. Geodipa siap untuk melanjutkan pengembangan proyek PLTP di Patuha yang masuk dalam Fast Track Program atau FTP tahap 2 10.000 MW. Bagian dari program 35.000 MW yang merupakan program pemerintah di bidang pembangunan infrastruktur ketenaga listrikan. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy uh, our video from, from our sponsor. The next, our third presenter is uh, Pak Muhammad Hasbi from Geotrama Master Program ITB. Pak Muhammad Hasbi. Please welcome, the time is yours.
Hello, everyone. My name is Muhammad Hasbi Asidiki, and I'm from the M Geothermal Engineering Master Program of Institute Technology Bandung. And today I'm going to present you uh, my result of my study result. And it's about the uh, method in the early stage of geothermal exploration. The title is Volcano Stratigraphy Study of Slamet Volcano and its Implication to its Early Stage of Geothermal Exploration. This is the outline of the presentation. There are introduction, aim of the study, method, general geological condition of study area, geothermal manifestation and its implication, result and discussion, and the conclusion. So volcano stratigraphy is a study of stratigraphy related to volcanism and its product. The term stratigraphy and this method determined with respect to volcanic source, deposit type, and sequence of time relative. So this analysis of volcano stratigraphy involves correlation between topographic map and volcanic product distribution based on the geological mapping of volcano local area. In this study contour map of A1 sheet uh, one to 100,000 and one to uh, 50,000 and geological map of Purwokerto until the goal. So the study area is located in Central Java province, Indonesia, included to the Berbes, Tegal, Pamalang, Purbalingga, and Banyuwang, Banyumas district. So the aim of the study is to conclude the estimation of geothermal potential within the Mount Slamet area based on its size, its location with respect to determination of volcano stratigraphy units, namely hammock, crown, brigade, super brigade, or arc. Starting with the analysis of topography map, were conducted to general the circular feature ridge and river pattern. These patterns are recognizable to be separated each other. And the different pattern might show different episode of genesis, might also be a clue of different volcanism process. Each volcano stratigraphy unit represents different volcanic eruption center. Hence, the determined volcano stratigraphy units in the study area will reveal the estimated size of geothermal potential based on criteria from which involves size and elevation of cone complex, degree of magmatic evolution, age and stress regime distribution of fence as its parameter. And it was described by Wallets and Haken. By involving the geological data map and its stratigraphy sequence, a careful joint interpretation were conducted to reveal the relative age of all volcanoes in the study area center of volcanic eruption which is characterized by circular feature or might be a small volcanic edifice without any eruption can be divided into hammock several of hammock or a single medium size of volcanic edifice create a crown a group crown become a brigade and some brigade and super brigades can form arc so a geothermal field potential can be calculated by knowing the volume of the volcano by assuming that the geometry of a volcano is a cone shape. The other consideration is the magma type of the volcano and the stress regime and its distribution of fence, which are considered to be the constant cause of permeable 
pathways for the hydrothermal fluid to ascend to the surface. So for the general geological condition of study area, based on the distribution of lithology extents, as shown in this map, it is clearly seen that Mount Slamet is a volcanic complex consists of more than one volcanism episode since the pyroclastic products are categorized, categorized as older and younger product. There were two sources of eruption on Mount Slamet, namely Old Slamet and Mount Slamet. The Mount Slamet Eruption Center, which has a lava dome in it's located at the east at the peak of Mount Slamet based on the chronology right here. This is the uh, central eruption of Mount Slamet. Based on the chronology of the product and its eruption center from old to young Mount Slamet is divided into two phases of volcanism, namely old Mount Slamet and Mount Slamet. Originally, Slamet volcano is included in stratigraphic section of Ruwakarta area, which has compiled by jury in 1975. There are four formations which are start, start stated to be the products of Mount Slamet, namely from old to young, the Lingopodo formation contains volcanic brexia, tuff, and lava are thought to be the result of the Mount Slamet activities, undefined Slamet volcanic rock consisting of volcanic brexia, lava, and tuff. Mount Slamet lava, which contains, which, which contains hollow and the site lava, and Mount Slamet lahar sediment containing lahar with lumps of volcanic rock and the site basal composition, which with 10 to 50 centimeter in diameter was produced by the old Mount Slamet lava from by the old Mount Slamet lava flow, I mean, from Mount Slamet associated with the cinder cone, where a common produced by Mount Slamet's vent and flank eruption during the quaternary period. This is considered as a cinder cone field, which indicate the presence of a huge magma supply accommodated by surface feature as its ascending pathway. The area of Mount Slamet is occupied by radial strike slip, faults with two main trend northeast southwest and southeast northwest in the eastern part of the area the relationship between tectonic stress and cinder cone alignments is more obvious the cinder cone appear in a radial alignment for the geothermal manifestation and its implication the manifestation within Mount Slamet area divided into two clusters based on its location, namely Gucci and Baduraden. Only both, only two of this manifestation uh, lies within the area of a uh, volcanostratigraphic unit that has been uh, has been defined previously. And uh, by combining the location of manifestation with the defined area of volcanostratigraphic unit, it could reveal the correlation between them. Baturadian cluster occurs within Baturadian crown, while Gucci cluster uh, within the Gucci crown. The analysis of major cation and anion ratio of the pH, of the, the pH and the temperature of each manifestation indicate that the location of those manifestation are the outflow zone of Mount Slamet geothermal system. Uh, since all the water are polluted in the immature water zone has neutral pH and warm water temperature. Further analysis of CLLIB in the trilinear diagram shows distinct characteristic between water from Gucci and Baturaden cluster, which indicate that those two clusters are of manifestation are representing two different geothermal system. So this is the result of um, our divine 
uh, for kinesthetic graphic unit. There are six crowns and two hammocks uh, within the Slamet Mountain area. There are namely Slamet Crown, Gucci Crown, Batu Raden Crown, Pandansari Crown, Batu Sari Crown, Karang Tengah Crown, Pasanggrahan Hammock, and Malang Hammock. Due to the relative uh, relatively closely distance between those crowns together, they could be regarded as a Slamet Brigade. The Slamet Brigade includes the area of more old Mount Slamet and Mount Slamet productions. The similar character of the old Mount Slamet and Mount Slamet products were identified, which leads to a concept that those two mountains were formed by eruption, which fed by a single magma chamber. On the other hand, uh, in the one to 50,000 scale counter map analysis gives a clear interpretation to determine the hammock within Mount Slamet area. There are Malang hammock and Sangran hammock. Those hammocks are located within the Slamet crown, the purple one. Those are the hammocks this one and the, this blue, the light blue one, they are included in this area of Slamet Crown. Um, so that uh, strongly mean that those small units were resulted from the same volcanism as Mount Slamet as a flank eruption based on the determination of four kinesthetography units the possibility of how beneficial a geothermal system would be after a detailed survey were estimated due to the hammocks are located within slamet crown area those two units not included to the criteria matching using flow from hyken and toilets the only stratigraphic unit which was involved in the criteria matching process is uh, those six grounds. And the result that Mount Slamet is possibly beneficial to be surveyed in the data since the summation size of the crown is approximately 291 kilometer cubic with silicic magma. Five, year old, five years old of last eruption and has a central volcanism structure creating a radial alignment of cinder cone and possibly a radial diaxial system. So the conclusion to this study is for stratigraphy units in Mount Slamet divided into six crowns and two hammocks, namely Slamet crown, Gucci crown, Baturadan crown, Pandansari crown, Batusari Crown, Karang Tengah Crown, Pasanggrahan Hamak, and Malang Hamak, based on the criteria matching to the flow chart from Wallets and Hiken, and regarding to the occurrence of future manifestation within the defined volcano stratigraphy units, Mount Slamet has a good possibility to be well developed by doing further exploration. Since Mount Slamet is a stratovolcano, the geothermal potential evaluation is being used appropriately in this study and the result of this method is reliable. These are our reference to this study. And that's all my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pa Muhammad Tasbi, for your very nice presentation. Now we are in the question and answer session. We already have one question. Let me do or read two questions. The first question is from Fadil Muhammad ITB. How to know the geothermal prospect based on volcano stratigraphy? Or this data only shows the stratigraphic of the volcano? Okay, maybe you can answer this first. Um, so basically this is, can you hear my voice clearly? Yes. Um, so basically, this is the uh, prelim preliminary 
method of uh, geothermal exploration and to determine the uh, to how to know the geothermal prospect based on full stratigraphy is to do the criteria matching uh, to the flow from Wohletz and Haken. And uh, from our defined uh, volcanostratigraphy unit, we can do the summation of the volcanostratigraphy unit uh, to make it, uh, to, to regard it uh, as a sh cone shape. And we calculate the volume and then we do the criteria matching. If it's uh, suitable to the uh, flow from wallet and Haken, and then we can know uh, is this uh, volcano is uh, prospectual for further exploration. And also we, we uh, also consider the age of the, uh, the, the volcano itself uh, when was the last eruption of the volcano, and also the um, the type of the, the magma type? Is it uh, silicic or basaltic? Um, silicic is more preferable for further exploration, and also the um, the form of the structure uh, when the 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 mountain is uh, forming a radial strike strike slip structure. It will be more preferable for the uh, for the exploration stage. So, yeah, uh, for Mount Slamet, um, yeah. most of the characteristic is uh, suitable to the flow from wallets and Hagen. Okay, okay, Pastor B, thank you. Because usually, when, when, uh, for example, in, in, in my case, when I did a uh, several volcano stratigraphy mapping for several volcano in Java, you should not only mention the hammer, you should mention the crown, but also the product including is it only lavas or consists of pyroplastic, lahar, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that, that is okay. And then the, the, the second question from Sefudin from Kyushu University. How how do this crown imply the heat source? Do you think that they represent sick heat source beneath the slammed volcano? Um for the heat source, um, uh, different volcano stratigraphy, stratigraphy units, uh, they don't. It doesn't mean that they have uh, six different source, but could be six different uh, volcanic eruption center. But um, it could be it could be grow grow grown from. Uh, the same uh, heat source, like the same magma chamber, um, but um, from uh, one episode to another, they move the central of the volcanic eruption. So that's why uh, they uh, create a different volcanic edifice that uh, makes it uh, clearly seen in the uh, topographic pattern analysis by visually analyzed and the um, different and could be seen by different uh, geologic, geological unit extent as well. And we do the matching from the analysis of topographic map, the refer pattern, the reach pattern to the extent of geological units. Okay, uh, Mr. Rabi, because uh, I mean, uh, uh, have you examined the major element from geochemical of of of, of all rock? For example, for the from, from the diagram KTO versus SIO two, usually we can identify this is coming from one magma chamber or from different magma chamber. Maybe the next uh, the next uh, study. Yeah. yeah, for the for the detail uh, for for us to be more confident for, from the result hmm. of this study, it could be done. Okay. Okay, the, the last question from Faiz Nafi, PT Ika Adia Perkasa. The question, how do we tell if the volcanic product we are observing is of laharic origin? What are the characteristics of laharic product of the field? If maybe you can explain with, 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 with photo if possible. Uh, I see. Um, for this question, I think I 
cannot uh, answer it uh, satisfyingly because um, what we been doing before is we use the reference we use the reference mm. from Judith 1975 okay. so we don't uh, make uh, we don't uh, create the distinctive uh, characteristic between if it's laharic or not so we we just we just um, applying this method uh, compare uh, comparing the uh, the previously mapped uh, geological unit and mm -hmm. uh, compare it to the topographic visual analysis okay so it's sorry like this. yeah that's okay so it means that at this time you just uh, refer to the previous pre uh, reference and also yes. from remote sensing analysis maybe right yeah the new ah. thing that I've done before is uh -huh. the interpretation, uh, the visual interpretation of the topographic analysis. Uh -huh. Okay, that's very clear. Okay, thank, once again, thank you very much, Pa Muhammad Kasbi, for your very good presentation. Please give applause for the presenter. Okay, uh, before. Um, yeah. So before we continue, there will be a video again from our sponsor. Please enjoy. Okay. Okay. Thank you for watching our video sponsor. Next, the, uh, the fourth presenter is uh, Nyora Dona from Geothermal Master Program ITB. Please welcome Nyora Dona, time is yours. I would like to welcome you in this presentation that will be presented to you by Nyora Dona about Volcanostatigraphic approach and its implication for geothermal erosion in Talang Volcano, West Sumatra. In this today's talk, I will take you through the introduction, which will consist about the background, objective, methodology, all the way to conclusion. Starting with the introduction, as all we are aware that Indonesia has more than 130 active and non-active volcanic uh, systems. And many of these uh, active and non-active volcano host geothermal prospect and proven to have high temperature geothermal system more than 225 degree Celsius. In this study, volcanostatigraphic approach was employed as a fundamental uh, stage in the conversion stage of surveying before explorations. Uh, in the study area, geologically, this area has been categorized into different units. First of all, we have the oldest tertiary metamorphic log, which is phyllite. 
to the old uh, volcanic which consists of uh, andesite and tooth pressure of quaternary age and lastly in the center which is quaternary lava volcanics consists of andesite tooth pressure and volcanic pyroclastics with surface deposits uh, why this area has been chosen for investigation? This is because uh, in Talang Volcano Prospect, uh, there, is, there is not yet full described uh, map on the local map scale which define the volcanic units. The same applies the analysis of this area in local map scale. So on this study, uh, this study tries to analyze the ridge dynamics and drainage flow patterns. The second one was to de delineate the source of volcano and classify the volcano stratigraphic units, which are Yumuk, Crown, Brigade, Spag Brigade, and or Arc if it will be investigated. And the last one was to evaluate the geothermal potential of the area. The first methodology of this investigation was employed was topo topographical map analysis, whereby one 100,000 and 150,000 map scale ratio was used. On this topographical map analysis, it was very important in determination of peak of the volcano, the highest contour, and also it was very important in identification of cyclo structures marked by the closures of the highest elevation contour lines. On these uh, lines, also contour, it helps us on demarcating the trace and tracing the ridge patterns marked by brown color, and also to trace the river patterns. In these uh, patterns, it was the assumption was made that the ridge patterns, they will never cross the river patterns. And lastly, it was to classify the volcanic stratigraphic units according to Bronto Soptigno 2016. The second methodology was to evaluate the geothermal potential of Talang Volcano, whereby a wallets and Haken evaluation guide was employed in 1992. Wallets and Haken used different parameters of development possibilities. The first one was uh, the volume of volcano whereby it deals with the dimensions of the volcano. Whereby if the volume of the volcano is greater than 50 kilometers square, there is a high possibility of development. If it's less, there is low. Another parameter was degree of magmatic evolutions. Whereby if it's the city to rioritic magmatic uh, it's, there is high possibility of development, and this one is slow development potential if there is basaltic to andesitic. Another parameter is age of volcanoes, whereby the age ranging from 50 to 20,000 years, this one it has high potential, and the age less than 50 and greater than 200, it has low. The last one was stretch regimes, whereby in these stretch regimes, uh, homogeneous stretch radio central vents he has been investigated. If there is radio or central vents, possibly there is high possibility of development. And if there is fissure vents, which is elongated, there is low development. And in the next stage of surveying, you have to see all of these high potentials. Then you can begin to next stage of surveying. The second methodology also, but based on the degree of uh, magmatism as well as uh, to define the immature or submature, which is also as uh, explained before. This one is, it helps only in investigating whether this area is mature or submature based on the time of maturations. So if the area it has more active Pumaroric, hot spleen, or the areas of uh, intermediate or silicic magmatism, this area is mature. 
but if it's morphic to intermediate magma, this is submature with fissure and central vents, while immature it is fissure vents with morphic magmas, so Strombonian and Vulcanian eruptions. The results of these investigations on the map scale of 1, 100,000, it was investigated that the peak of the volcano in this area, it's around this center here, and the ridge from Pythons was dominated on the northern, west, southern directions to the southeast direction, whereby in the western direction, as you can see on this map, it's somehow less. And on the map scale of one to ratio of 50,000, as you can see, three peak was investigated in this area. And apart from that also, the flow pattern still dominates in the northwest, southeast, and also it was lack on the western side. But mostly to the eastern side, the, the flow of these patterns, ridge including and levers, it was dominated. And following this manifestation area, as you can see, cold spring with uh, greenish, as you can see here on top, which demarcate the flow patterns out for from the volcanic vents and the hot spring almost around the volcanic vents, together with fumaloes directly on the top of these vents. And uh, volcanostratigraphic unit uh, that has been investigated on the map scale of 1, 100,000. There are one brigade, as you can see, huge brigade, which has three crowns, I mean eruption centers. The first one and the oldest one was investigated was Talang Bawa crown, then Talang Jatan crown, and the, this greenish Talang Batino crowns. And on the map scale of 150,000, these uh, three volcanostratigraphic unit, which is crown, another homogeneous monogenetic parasitic volcano was investigated whereby uh, the older Bakal in the western side was investigated based on geological map as well within the Talang Jantan clown and within uh, Talang Batino the middle Yumok was been investigated reddish in color and yellowish in color this is the youngest uh, Jantan Yumok within the Talang power crown. So from these results as well, uh, the volume of uh, volcanic chamber was determined based on this volume. And uh, there is three parameters that were used, including the radius, average distance between pairs of the slopes, and it was three. Apart from that also, um, there is T, which is the elevation between the highest marked peak and the surrounding ever lowest elevation. This marked to be the thickness of the veins, where uh, it calculated like a uh, circular, and uh, the investigated of this cylinder volume like vent, it was 33.9 kilometer cubics. And from this result, it was interpolated that this topographic map in comparison with the published geological maps, it gave a good correlation between the interpolated volcanostratigraphic unit boundaries and the distribution of volcanostratigraphic units. The radio arrangement of rivers, as you can see in the previous maps and ridges patterns, are more raised toward the volcanic centers and it flow more outward from the volcano vents. So the system 
as you can see on those parameters that uh, has been explained before, which was age and magmatic and volume as well. This, they show a low uh, possibility of development. Why low possibility of development based on volume? Because the volume of the volcano was less than 50, if you remember on the wallets guide. And based on the age of volcano, the last uh, volcanic in Talang, it was 2007. And this uh, show that it is less than 50 years, so also it has low development potential. While it, in contrary to uh, radio, because in the radio vent, this area is somehow sub mature to mature stage of a uh, volcano. So due to these uh, radio vents, which it has a huge caldera within, so directly it give high development potential. So if you can see this, uh, there is two parameters that they mark low and this one high. And also another parameter is being andesitic. It suggests that the volcano experiencing a low degree of magmatic evolution. And it categorized to submature and mature stage of volcano. On the conclusions, three units was been investigated, including one brigade three eruption centers, which is crown, and three individual monogenetic parasitic volcano, Yumuk, was investigated and delineated within these two kinds of map scales. As you can see, most of the levers and ridge flow patterns, it was marked from the highest point and away from the volcanic center, the flow toward the volcanic center with correlation with the manifestation as well. Based on development parameters such as dimension, age, and stress regimes, all make it impossible for further detailed geothermal explorations. But in estimation of magma chamber volume, together with the fact that this volcano is a much stage of, uh, of maturations, so more studies must be conducted just to determine the volume of Talang volcanic vents. Apart from this, this mark the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nyora uh, Dona, for your nice and great presentation. Now we are in the question and answer session. Uh, there is already, we have one, one question from, let me check. One question from Atna. University of Diponegoro, Semarang. How many heat source that Montalang have? That's the first question. Please, Pa Nyora Dona. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you get me, please? Yes. Get me. Yes. Uh, in Talang uh, volcano, there is uh, have been investigated three sources of volcano, as has been explained, which has uh, three sources of volcano, which is crown, as uh, Sopino Pronto suggested from his studies. So, so we can identify the heat source from the, from the, the hammock, right? From the crown. Uh, the resource, if you want to investigate uh, the resource of mm -hmm. this volcanic, first of all, you have to know the size of the volcanic vent. Uh -huh. okay. After knowing this, uh, the, the, the size of volcanic vent and know the shape of it, normally most of the vents are somehow vertical, like a cylinder. So we can use even the volume of cylinder to determine the volume. Though, because we didn't do uh, detailed studies, that's why I suggest uh, geophysical studies must be conducted to know the depth of these vents uh, to the reservoir. And after, after that, we can determine even the size of that vent so that to know exactly 
each vent from the crown, it has how much uh, amount of reservoir that it contains. Okay. Thank you, Pa Nyora. And then the second question, maybe this is the last question from Fata Star Energy. What is the, the recommended method for future uh, for, for future exploration in the Montalang if it is still possible for existence of geothermal system? Uh, first of all, from my investigation, the mm -hmm. evaluation of potential for Montalang, uh, mm -hmm. most of the parameter they come to conclusion as a low possibility. But uh, mm -hmm. maybe other investigation can come with a very crew more than this, because this is just the pre preliminary recognizance. So I suggest, first of all, the geological study to be conducted. This geology will come out with uh, the, the suggestion, because uh, we, are, we, are, we are just focusing on volcanostatic graphic first and volcanostatic graph in general. So we have to conduct geology to make uh, the geological very detailed map uh, scale that will come with uh, some scales of uh, each volcanic unit and product. From volcanic unit and the product also, we can uh, know exactly uh, which is the maybe source of uh, volcano, uh, the area of magma chamber, uh, okay. the heat source, and the other manifestation also mapped to know exactly the upflow and the for directions. Then after this, uh, geochemistry mm. must be conducted as well to know uh, the reservoir characteristics. And from the reservoir characteristics, uh, you, we know exactly if this is potential or not potential for other uh, further feasibility studies. Thank you, Pa Nyora. So you suggest for conduct theoretical mapping in the tail scale and then followed by geochemistry and then finally by geophysics, right? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Once again, thank you very much for your great presentation. Please give applause to the presenter. Okay, uh, as usual, before we continue our session, let's enjoy our uh, sponsor, our, our video from our sponsor. Thank you very much for watching our sponsor video. So now we are going to the fifth uh, presenter. The fifth presenter is Pa Sapto Triango from Pertamina Geothermal Energy. He is also Geothermal Master Program. This is also a student from Geothermal Master Program. Pa Sapto Triango, please welcome. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to ITB International Geothermal Workshop 2020. Uh, before I presenting this paper, let me introduce myself. My name is Sabto Tengunur Seto. Now I work as a geoscientist in PG Indonesia. Uh, with me in the preparation of this paper is Ms. Uh, Julia Satriani, uh, Mr. Mohamed Tamrin, and Mrs. Nini Surantini. For the next 15 minutes, uh, I will presentation about 
Productive Geological Structure in Volcanogenic System of Lumut Balai, Geothermal Field, uh, Indonesia. Uh, the presentation outline is introduction and then the method. Uh, the method what we use in the scientific study is surface data analysis and subsurface data analysis. Uh, and the result, the end of the result is knowing the production productive structural geology who control the remote balai permeability and the conclusion. Remote balai is located approximately on 292 kilometers surface of Palembang, around eight hours of driving from the Palembang airport. Uh, geoscientific research in remote balai has been ongoing since 1993, uh, which uh, include uh, geological research, geochemical research, and geophysical, geophysical research. Uh, currently, Naulut Balai already production for 1 by uh, 55 megawatt and, uh, and planning to expand uh, for unit 2. Uh, one by 55 megawatt more. The, the scientific research of Lord Balai, which will be discussed further in this paper, has been ongoing since uh, early exploration phase. Uh, the, first, the first exploration well was drilled in 2008. Until currently, there are nine clusters with 20 production wells and nine injection wells. Lumut, Geot, Lumut Balai Geothermal Field uh, is situated within Old uh, Lumut Caldera, which is approximately about 9 km in diameter. Uh, permeability is one of the main components of a geothermal system in volcanic setting, which are one of the most common geological setting in geothermal uh, permeability is uh, mostly <coughs> controlled by geological structure such as fault and fracture zone. Uh, it could also be controlled by geological contact and the formation uh, host uh, characteristic. Understanding the permeability distribution of a geothermal field is an essential key to the exploration success. It is important to understand the productive structure in Lumut Balai as an uh, ideal example uh, of geothermal field that occur within a caldera. Uh, as a reference uh, for the geothermal field with uh, similar plate type, uh, volcanic occurrence in Sumatra is related to Sumatra fault system activity proven by the distribution of uh, neogen quaternary around Sumatran fault and expanding from southeast to uh, northwest of Sumatra. Lumutua Caldera is located around 60 km east of the Comori segment, uh, eastern side. Volcanic uh, eruption center in Lumut Balai, Pandan Hill, Panindayan Hill, Ringgit Hill, Lumut Hill form a north-south uh, lineage pattern. This north-south trend is tough to be the product of pre-tertiary pre uh, north-south fault reactivation by the quaternary recent stress uh, system. And the method. Uh, there are two methods we use to analyze the permeability in Lumut Balai. Uh, first is uh, surface data, include uh, leader and IFSAR image analysis, and geological mapping and outcrop measurement in the field, compiling a detailed Lumut Balai composite log uh, and structure map, also XRD and petrography analysis. And the second method is uh, from subsurface data, include uh, well cutting and core, uh, well bore data like uh, borehole image, uh, drilling parameter, 
XRD and Petrography Analysis from Cutting and Core, uh, Geophysical Measurements, like MT and Gravity Measurement, also uh, Resistivity Logging, Sonic Logging, uh, and then the Surface and Subsurface Data uh, are then compiled and input to 3D modeling software to construct uh, Lumut Balai uh, 3D model. Mm, on the left picture, the green color showing the gentle slope and the red co color show the high slope. While on the right side, the right side, right picture, the color variation show the slope uh, direction. Leader and IMSAR meta analysis uh, inferred that the geological structure in Lumut Balai shows an old volcanic complex that has collapsed forming a giant caldera which is then referred to as called Lumut Caldera. Uh, this volcanic complex uh, was built by the series of eruption center which are Pandan, Ringgit, Lumut, Balai Hill. Uh, on the margin of the caldera rim, a new eruption center could be seen. On the southeastern flank of the caldera is a uh, Lumut Hill, and uh, on the northwestern side is uh, Balai Hill. Uh, all across the western flank of the old Lumut caldera are relatively not so trending fault. Uh, the two lineament pattern in the center of old Lumut caldera could be interpreted as uh, northeast-southwest and northwest-southeast fault. Some major faults are associated with the occurrence of geothermal manifestations such as uh, ringki, gemuha besar, udangan, and Tanjung Tiga. Meanwhile, on the eastern side, the geothermal prospect boundary is limited by old uh, Lumut Caldera Rim. The surface data obtained by observe and measuring outcrop in the field is one of the main data used for this research. Uh, outcrop from uh, Panas River, Erpatahan River, and all outcrop along the prospect area has been observed, measured, and analyzed for this paper purpose. Uh, the data obtained from the observation are lithology, lithological contact, alteration, mineral assemblage, and strike deep measurement of joint and silicon line. And specimen and clay sample were also taken from the outcrop, outcrop to be further analysis uh, in laboratory. And the product from the surface face mapping is a geological detail map and composite log. Uh, it is inferred from the liturgical history related with the morphology and elevation that Lumut Balai has undergone uh, constructive and destructive phases. Lumut Balai is at least divided into 14 rock units uh, determined by surface mapping obtained from around Lumut Balai Jotemal field. Outside of, within, outside of and within the old Lumut Caldera, with elevation starting from 870 to 1880 meters above sea level. In addition, morphological characteristics are also obtained from leader image, enabling a more accurate rock determination. From petrography analysis, it is known that the old Lumut Caldera is dominated by explosive rock such as andesite, peroxine andesite, andesite lava, brexia, tuff altered, tuff and conglomerate. From surface mapping, there are no intrusive rock found. Most of the sample found 
uh, in the surface has been hydrothermally altered and uh, intensely weathered. Uh, based on the trend and type, the structural geology in Lumut Balai could be divided to main group, which are first group for the who are not uh, related to the regional stress pattern, more closely related to the Lumut Balai caldera formation and caldera radial fault. Uh, found on the old Lumut caldera body. Uh, second group is structural geology that are related to the regional stress uh, for trending north-south, northeast-southwest, and northwest-southeast. Uh, where are the uh, three times is control the manifestation distribution. Except the old Lumut Tua Caldera, six other of the structural geology who control the permeability of Lumut Balai, Gemuha Besar, Rerinki, Udangan, Patahan, Ugan, Karana, Tanjung Tiga, according to the regional tectonic pattern, for trending north-south and north-southwest are first fault to develop and it starts to be demand for uh, land in Lumut Balai. This fault land is the center of Lumut Balai Quaternary volcanic activity. This fault have likely been reactivated by younger regional stress, proven by the geothermal manifestation occurring along the fault near Lumut Hill, Panindayan Hill. For system trending northwest southeast are the latest to develop and reactivated by the Sumatran fault, such as Udangan and Tanjung Tiga fault. This main fault system control the permeability of the prospect area. From cutting and core data, Lumut Balai Rock Unit could be divided into five stratigraphic units, starting from the oldest to youngest. Uh, the oldest is Tarsier Basement Unit, pre -old, uh, Lumut Unit, pre Caldera Unit, Caldera Unit, and Post Caldera Unit. The tertiary basement unit is composed mainly of meta sediment lithology. While this is this unit was not found on the well within the old Lumut Caldera. Uh, more we found more commonly in well outside of the Lumut Caldera. Uh, pre old Lumut. Unit uh, consists of tufbrexia within foraminifera fossil content we found in inside the caldera. Uh, we found from 500 uh, to minus 1,000 meter above sea level. Uh, Subsurface structural geology during Lumut Balai drilling campaign borehole image logging was carried in some Lumut Balai well. Uh, by picking out the conductive structure seen through the borehole image log, a rosette diagram which represent the distribution of the fracture strike and dip could be construct. Uh, furthermore, by correcting the conductive fracture zone, uh, from its well, 3 d factor zone model could be constructed. A correlation of total loss circulation zone could uh, provide information regarding the elevation distribution of total loss circulation zone. The shallowest loss circulation zone could be found inside in lot low mode uh, in elevation around 700 meters above sea level and the deep the uh, loss circulation zone are found in well outside of low mode, approximately in elevation minus 1,000 meter above sea level. Uh, from this table, we can see uh, the seven structural geology uh, who control the Lumut Balai field. One uh, ring fault, what we call out Lumut Caldera. And six other is a uh, tectonic product. Bumwa, Rinki, Arudangan, Patan, Ogan, and Tanjung Tiga. And the conclusion, Lumut Balai Geothermal Field is one of the example of geothermal field located with Caldera. 
composed of andesite, andesite breccia, basal tekan di seed, basalt, limestone, metal sediment, tuff, uh, which are altered to certain extent. There are five stratigraphic unit starting from the oldest to young are tertiary basement, pre-old lumut, pre-caldera unit, caldera unit, and post-caldera unit. Uh, productive geological structure with good permeability are found within the old lumut caldera. Productive fault in lumut balai are iron key fault with north east southwest trend, air rudangan fault trending north east southwest, old lumut caldera, and air bumbu besar with trend north south. Mm, thank you for your great attention. My order will have a beneficial for all of us. Keep safe and keep healthy. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Pak Sabto Tianggo, for very nice presentation. So now we are in the uh, question and answer session due to the limited uh, time. I only maybe only one question. Maybe is there any question from the audience? Okay, this is a question from Wardana University, Universitas Negeri Manado. What kind of geological structure that found in Old Lumut Balai? I think it is a strike ship fault. Is it true, Pak Pak Sab, pa Sabto? Yes, Pak Mirzam. Uh, yeah. Structural default in uh, Lumut Balai is uh, strike ship fault. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your confirmation. So, mm. short question uh, from Tony Vidya uh, Moro. Which one has higher permeability? Fracture created by collapse due to the caldera forming or only uh, fault only? Uh, from the data, uh, as we know, uh, a structural geological uh, structural fault in uh, Lumut Balai it's uh, very productive uh, uh, and for the uh, rock unit what we found in uh, Lumut Balai uh, we use for uh, to uh, a key marker for uh, uh, drilling camping. Okay, yeah, thank you, Pak. So, thank you, there are still some question but you did limit uh, the limitation of time maybe i will send the question letter to you maybe once again thank you very much pa sabto tiango please give applause for him oh, okay okay thank you very much uh, the audience so before uh, we go to the next presenter as usual please enjoy uh, our video from our sponsor PT Kogindo Daya Bersama adalah perusahaan ketenaga listrikan di Indonesia yang beroperasi di seluruh wilayah Indonesia dari Sabang sampai Merauke. Kogindo didirikan pada tahun 1998 sebagai anak perusahaan PT Indonesia Power dan bagian dari PT PLN Persero. Kogindo memiliki empat bidang usaha, yaitu suplai energi, jasa operasi dan pemeliharaan pembangkit listrik, jasa gas dan diesel engine, dan jasa maintenance, repair, overhaul, MRO. Dalam kurun waktu lebih dari dua dekade, kami telah mengembangkan bisnis kami secara signifikan dan membangun dasar yang kokoh bagi portofolio perusahaan di level nasional maupun internasional. Kogindo menawarkan satu solusi layanan terintegrasi di bidang ketenaga listrikan melalui Kogindo Integrated Solution dengan menggabungkan kompetensi Teknologi dan pengalaman, kami yakin dapat membantu para pelanggan mencapai efisiensi dan keandalan pengoperasian pembangkit listrik di Indonesia dan seluruh belahan dunia. Kogindo, trusted partner for power generation. Thank you for watching. So now we are going to the last presenter for technical session. The last presenter will be Pak Fanji Junanda Putra. Pak Wanji Junanda Putra is from Star Energy. 
the bachelor degree from ITB. Hi everyone, oh, okay. please let me introduce myself. My name is Fanji Junanda Putra. I am geologist from Star Energy that handled Salak Geothermal Field. Today, I would like to share to all of you about the case holder memory log assessment and application at Salak Field. Okay, this is the outline for my presentation for the next uh, 15 minutes. So I will start with the introduction that consists of Salak Field brief overview and the background of our study. And then I will continue with the case hold gamma ray assessment that consists of workflow and result and following with the case hold gamma ray applications. Lastly, I will give you the summary of my presentation. So, Salak, as known as Awi Bangkok Field, is the largest geothermal field in Indonesia with installed capacity is 377 megawatt. This field located 70 kilometers southwest of Jakarta with the commercial with commercial production area is about 30 kilometers squares. By this big uh, commercial production area, there are 110 wells has been built in this field. Now we move to the Awi Bangkok stratigraphic sections. So Salak is covered by thick volcanic deposit and it has typical mature arc volcanic sequence. The rock was dominated by tough horse pyroclastic and andesitic uh, to andesitic lava. The formation here in the right figure is used the formation terminology, but it actually not have formally correlated with documented, documented formation on the regional basis. It's only uh, used to refer to the distinctive time-bounded rock sequences. As you can see in here, if we take a look, there are four major formations. From the oldest to youngest are, the first one is lower volcanic formations that consists of marine sediment and volcanic plastic, or we call MSV. Above it, there are lower and side. Above of the lower volcanic formation, there are RDM or geodesic markers. This formation is the marker in Salak field because this formation is widely distributed in the field. And the last, I mean, in the, and above it, there are middle volcanic formation and upper volcanic formation. Both, both mother, middle and upper volcanic formation, it consists of the series of desitic and andesitic rock with the, with the overlaying each other. In addition, there are multiple intrusion are spread out over a Wibikok geothermal field. Now we go to the background. So as we know, the rock samples is essential data for subsurface characterization, especially stratigraphy analysis. However, very few or no rock cutting are obtained in the reservoir section. Actually, this is common phenomenon because mud circulation is lost while we are drilling reservoir hole sections. So in order to get little information, we can conduct a conventional or set wall course in the reservoir section, but it gives uh, time consumption and expensive and risky especially we did conduct it during drilling activity. So there are an alternative way to gather lithology information by uh, using wireline logging. And gamma ray log tool is provide more continuous data set in reservoir sections. Unfortunately, in Salak, the open hole gamma ray that we get during drilling activities, it's very minimum, less than 20% of total wells. But uh, it, uh, it's very lucky that in current situation, in current condition, uh, they are gamma ray tool that can be attached in bottom hole assembly of our PT or PTS survey. So by using this case hole gamma ray data, it providing us an opportunity to collect infill data. Now we go to the workflow of the case hole gamma ray assessments. So we start with the gathering that uh, and following with the KQC process. This KQC process is very important because it will control us in determining which case hole gamma ray that will be used for next applications. If you see there is the not here, so if I just give a, a brief description, the LD means a lockdown, so it's mean that gamma ray data that was read during the tool goes down on the well bore, while lock up is when the data is recorded during the tool, it goes up. In addition, in this assessment, we also use uh, open hole gamma ray as the comparison, if the open hole gamma ray is available at a particular well. Okay, now the result. So actually, the case of the Mare data set that I use in this paper was obtained during 2017 to 2018. Within this interval, there are 55 surface that were conducted in 39 wells. So if we take a look, the result from 39 wells here, there are 36 uh, well in the good quality data and three in the suspect data, has a suspect data. But if we compare the case of the Mare with the open hole gamma ray, there are nine out of 10 well have similar pattern between the case and open hole gamma ray. In the next slide, I will show you the example what is the good data, inconsistent data, and the suspect data. So the good quality data first. 
So let me describe first about the figures. So the blue line here, it's describe the lockup data, while for the red here, it's represent lockdown data. For the green line here, it represent open hole, I mean, the data that we get during dealing activities. So in the good quality data, the casual array data exhibiting a consistent lockdown and lockup gamma array pattern, even in multiple survey. And it also have similar trend with the open hole gamma array. While for the inconsistent, inconsistent uh, condition, in this example, what I show to you, there are inconsistent pattern at the shallow depth that represent by this box here. Uh, and when we take a look at the condition, we show there are different wellbore condition during logging survey. So the first one inject in, or the other, uh, then the others is flowing. So if we have cutting data available, I mean, in term to solve this issue, sometimes we use another data. So if we have cutting data available, so it at the consistent depth here, for example, it can uh, help us by, uh, so we can conduct uh, petrography analysis, so it can support us in determining which pattern it's more preferred. For suspicious data here, as you can see in here, between the lockdown and lockup, there are discrepancy. And unfortunately, in this uh, data, I mean, in this well, usually we don't have another data to be compared. So other data for case hall or open hall are unavailable. So if we encounter this situation, sometimes this well will be in parking lot. So we will not use this case hall gamma ray. So we will uh, have uh, further assessment if we have another survey. So we can determine which preferred uh, pattern for uh, this well. Now we move to casual gamma ray applications. So casual gamma ray data actually can be utilized to support subsurface lithology and formation integration. And it based on previous study that indicate that natural gamma ray in geothermal so far have good correlation with the silica content in the rock. Based on Stephenson 2000 and it corroborated by Sere et al. 2008 that mentioned that radioactive content it's higher it felt sick or acid rock compared to basic or mafic meso. If we take a look in the sala, there are two formations, which is red acid marker or RDM and marine sediment volcanic plastic or MSV, have distinct gamma ray patterns. The RDM formation has the highest gamma ray count compared to other formation in the sala reservoir because this formation is mainly composed by rheolitic and rheodacitic tuff. So it has highest silica content compared to other rocks. In addition, most RDM, it consists of three layers, whereas the top and bottom has rheodacitic. In the middle of it, there are uh, andesitic composition rock. So because of that, in the RDM, we usually find two spikes. Unlike the RDM, in MSV, the gamma ray count is uh, relatively, we have wider range and relatively high. And we think that because MSV is consists of mix of volcanic and sediment, so if we are believed that the sediment, like the shell, we find shell and silton there, the content of the sediment, it gives the significant contributor to high gamma ray content in these formations. So I will give to you the example of the gamma ray application. So as you can see in here, there are two wells. So I will start with AV15-3 RD1 first. So let me describe the column first. So this column, it represents the depth. After that, in the blue line here, it represents open hole gamma ray, while the purple line, it represents the case hole gamma ray. In this column, it represents the result of petrography analysis. And this column, it represents the lithology after we integrate between the cutting uh, description and petrography. And the uh, most right here, it represents the, uh, the formation interpretations. So as you can see, based on this figure, this one, the point that we got here, the first, it's there are similarity due to the case hole and open hole gamma ray pattern. And both RDM and MSV formation has relatively high gamma ray count where the RDM has two spike at the top and the bottom. And the top of RDM here, it's corroborated or validated by the petrographic analysis that we found the rheodacity tough. While for the MSV, it's uh, the top of MSV also confirmed by petrography by, by we finding uh, limestone in the, pet in the petrography analysis. And MSV also have a uh, high and wider range of case hole gamma ray or gamma open hole gamma ray. Now we move to 10 days force. So uh, another application in case hole gamma ray is we try to confirm our previous interpretation like in our 10 days for here. So initially the formation in this well is interpreted it, uh, it's interpreted uh, using megascopic description first. So based on thin section and cutting descriptions. Uh, as you can see in here, we encountered total loss circulation below 3000 feet MD. 
So it's mean the RDM interval it's uh, become uncertainty. After we run Kessel gamma ray, the Kessel gamma ray are give us uh, more. I mean the confirmation of the interval of uh, RDM itself. So it can be accurately identifying what is RDM interval. In addition, by using Kessel gamma ray. It also give us a new interpretation about where is the top of MSV. Okay, this is the example of the correlation and then the cross section uh, from the 10 days four. So as you can see in here, the Kessel gamma ray data, it will give us the confirmation about uh, if we try to correlate with other ways. Now we move to another application of the Kessel gamma ray. So the Kessel gamma ray also we use to evaluate the contact between upper and the side on the side or UA and middle on the side or MA formations. So if we uh, move little bit, I mean back a little bit with, with the uh, salak, and as you can see in, in middle and the upper uh, volcanic formation, they are middle the side. The middle the side actually uh, separate between the upper and the side and middle and the side, like this one, in this, uh, this one, where we have the middle the side have relatively higher gamma ray compared upper and the side and middle and the side, of course. But unfortunately, the upper and the, sorry, the middle and the side, middle the side, is not continuously distributed. So in the western portion of uh, Salak, the middle of the side is uh, not exist. So it's become another problem. So we should post to know where we can put the boundary between upper and the side and middle and the side. So because of that, we're trying to evaluating is there any distinct pattern or characteristic between the case gamma ray in UA and MA? So in here, we try to evaluating the U, uh, I mean the case gamma ray in the MA or UA where the MD exists. So the first one, we try to determine the contact using the case gamma ray trend. So let me describe first. So the blue dot here, it's the represent the UA, while the red dot here, it represents the MA number of geomeric count, while the Y axis here, it represents the depth. So in this evolution, we normalize the comparisons. So because of that, the depth here in Y axis, it starts start from tops of the UA and MA. And based on this uh, evaluation, we found that both UA and MA actually have similar gamma ray trend, where the gamma ray count at the bottom of the UA is almost identical with the top of the MA. So because of that, it's really hard to separate them if you only look the gamma ray trend. So because it's inconclusive, we go to the second attempt. So we will focus on the gamma ray magnitude or the value itself. So we use the ranges or an average of gamma ray count of the UA and MP. So let me describe first with the table in the right figure here. So in here, the column here, it's the gamma ray count range in UA with the bracket number here, it's the average number, and this one in MA. For the color code here, the purple one, it's uh, it's mean that the average number of the MA is higher than UA, vice versa. So based on this table, the inconsistency was observed, where the average gamma ray count in the sum well, sometimes the UA is higher than MA, and sometimes MA is higher than uh, UA. So, it's hard to you. I mean, hard to determine if you only take a look at the average number. But interestingly, if we look the range of gamma ray count in MA is higher compared to UA, so it actually gives us the hints in the distinguishing uh, between the UA and MA. But it still cannot answer where is the contact for UA and MA. Now we go uh, the summary of my presentation. So the first one, the detailed assessment of the Kessel gamma ray with interval 20. 2017 to 2018, it shows that 92% of Kessel gamma ray have good quality data. And if we compare with open hole gamma ray, actually there are 90% of Kessel gamma ray have similar pattern with open hole gamma ray. The minor consistent inconsistency that we show sometimes appears at shallow depth. And we think that sometimes the shallow depth, because a weak signal between the formation and we know in shallow depth, the casing is very big. Sometimes it um, causes the weak signal of gamma ray. And the second one, uh, gamma ray count in the case hall is various widely between wells, even in one well, but in different surface. So because of that, we cannot uh, compare the gamma, uh, gamma ray using the gamma ray value or count. What we use to compare between wells, it's the pattern. And also it's impractical to find out the calibration number between open hole and the case hall gamma ray. 
Uh, the third is the Kessel gamma ray can be utilized in interpreting subsurface lithology information, especially if any distinct differences are present. For example, in our formation, we have rheolitic layers, and in between, in between the rheolitic or dacitic, we have andesitic. So it can help us in distinguishing the, the lithology or formations. The fourth one is if we go to the Salak case, Kessel gamma ray was utilized in determining, in determining RDM and MS formation where both formations have high gamma ray count. This is very essential formation because the RDM is uh, proven as the best stratigraphic marker at the Salak. And it will support us in such an interpretation if any offset in top RDM appears. For the MSV, it's very essential because based on our previous study, most of deep fit zone in Salak are occur in MSV. And the last uh, observation that we got, the initial observation, it suggests that Kessel gamma ray just give us a guidance in differentiating UNMA, but it's uh, still inconclusive if we just want to take a look the contact for the be between UNMA. I think that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Pak Panji Junanda Putra. Very, very nice presentation. Yeah, already we have one question from University of Diponegoro. Let me to to read from Yoyakin University of Diponegoro for Pak Panji. What the implication from this study to the to the development plan? Okay, yes. Uh, yes. Jelas, Mas? Yes, yes, I can okay. hear your voice. Uh, okay, so for development plan, so for the Salak, so it will help us to, I mean, to guide us in order to revise our stratigraphy, especially uh, if you take a look in the Kessel Gamma Ray, it will give us uh, insight about the, especially for top RDM. So if mm -hmm. we have found essentially data for, I mean, for uh, good data in terms of the RDM. So if offset will appear, so it help us to structure interpretation. For the MSV, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, if we know the MSV and based on our research previously, the MSV is uh, the top MSV, most of it our deep pit zone or entry located in MSV. So it mean uh, it help us to in term of the well targeting. I hope it's. Uh, I hope it uh, answer the question, Mas Mirzam. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Fanji. And then the second question. This is my my question actually. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, if we have to to adjust a well, very close mm -hmm. uh, well, and then how to correlate uh, the data, the gamma ray data from one well to to another? Since we know that uh, very easy. Mm -hmm in totally complex that the lithology changes rapidly or influenced by hydrothermal alteration? Uh, so because of that mass, in terms of the adjacent well, when we take a look, for mm -hmm. example, uh, in my previous example in AWI 10, uh, uh -huh. so it's not significant change in terms of, because in here we lump it, so we use the formation, we are not use the lithology basis. And in Salak, uh, uh, we, our formation most mainly differentiate by the composition. So in my, in Salak, for example, we have upper on the side, upper the side, uh, uh -huh. etc. I mean middle the side. So it's mean uh, so the, the 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 formation actually it's composed mainly by those uh, rock composition. So sometimes it really distinct and the distinctive gamma ray mostly. Uh, show at uh, RDM and MSV mass. Sometimes for the middle the site, because the middle is the site mostly composed by the dacitic, uh, the gamma ray count is relatively higher compared to the upper and middle on the site mass. Ah, okay, okay. But in terms of if we correlate, mm. if it has good correlation between adjacent well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm just thinking the link with uh, your friend study about focal stratigraphy. Yeah, but oh, maybe yes. uh, yeah, talk uh, we discuss later. Yep. Okay, thank you, Pa Fanji, uh, yes. for your very great presentation. Please give applause for Pa Fanji. Thank you very much, Mas Mirzam. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we continue, as usual, there will be a video from our sponsor. Please enjoy.
Indonesia merupakan salah satu negara yang memiliki potensi energi panas bumi terbesar di dunia. Saat ini, Indonesia menduduki peringkat dua dunia sebagai negara penghasil listrik dari energi panas bumi. Selain sebagai energi yang bersih dan berkelanjutan, peran energi panas bumi sebagai base load penyediaan listrik menjadi pertimbangan utama agar pengembangannya diprioritaskan. Oleh karena itu, dalam menjaga ketahanan energi suatu negara, energi panas bumi dapat menjadi andalan untuk memasok listrik guna memenuhi target bauran energi 23% EBT di tahun 2025, sesuai dengan amanat dari kebijakan energi nasional. Untuk memenuhi pencapaian target EBT, dalam bauran energi tersebut, Indonesia layak melakukan percepatan pembangunan proyek PLTP di Indonesia. PT Geodipa Energi Persero adalah perusahaan yang bergerak di bidang energi panas bumi mulai dari eksplorasi hingga eksploitasi. Perusahaan didirikan pada tanggal 5 Juli tahun 2002. Kemudian pada tahun 2011, melalui peraturan pemerintah nomor 62 tahun 2011, Geodipa ditetapkan sebagai persero yang pengawasan dan pembinaannya berada di bawah Kementerian Keuangan dan PT PLN Persero. Yang juga merupakan salah satu Special Mission Vehicle atau SMV di bawah Kementerian Keuangan dengan misi mendukung program pemerintah dalam penyediaan listrik tenaga panas bumi yang aman dan ramah lingkungan, serta memberikan manfaat besar kepada Indonesia. Geodipa siap untuk melanjutkan pengembangan proyek PLTP di Yang Patuha yang masuk dalam Fast Track Program atau FTP tahap 2 10.000 MW. Bagian dari program 35.000 MW yang merupakan program pemerintah di bidang pembangunan infrastruktur ketenaga listrikan. Ya, yeah, thank you very much for watching the video from our sponsor. Next is uh, our second invited speaker from John Broderich. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please note that for this presentation from invited speaker, there, there will be no question and answer session. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Jen Broderich from uh, is project manager from GOING program, Jacob. Okay, the time is short, James. Hi, everybody. This is Jane Brotheridge, and I am calling from um, New Zealand in Christchurch. Um, I'm from Jacobs and my presentation today is on our GeoInz program. Now I'm just going to share my screen. Right, hope that's coming through loud and clear. So I am the project manager of the GeoInz program which is funded by the New Zealand A program, a five-year program supporting the acceleration of geothermal development in Indonesia. So my um, talk this afternoon, um, just this is the main point, so I'll uh, introduce the program and the details about that. Um, then I'll go on to talk about our collaboration with one of our partners, Barang Geology, and the focus we've been having on lower temperature resources, and finally to wrap up collaboration with industry. A couple of photos there, you might recognise some people or even yourselves. The top right one is a feasibility study workshop we held last year, um, I think in March, perhaps, I'm not quite sure. And the bottom one, of course, is the launch, the official launch of the Indonesian chapter of WING. So the GeoInz program, as I mentioned, this is funded as part of the New Zealand aid program and uh, Jacobs was appointed <coughs> to provide technical assistance and capacity development to three Government of Indonesia entities, namely Barang Geology, EBTKE and PTSMI. And this activity is known as the GeoInz program. Um, it was split into two parts. We're currently in phase two. Phase one um, was intended to, pro intended to provide intense support over 15 months and to fully assess the capability and needs of the partners and to get runs on the board and build relationships. The second phase, which is due to finish in a year from now, uh, is intended to provide less intense but longer term support with more targeted capacity development. Um, for the three entities, I'll, just, I'll come to Barang Geology lastly, but EBTKE, um, the main features is providing regulatory support 
um, in, of which we're all waiting with bated breath, is to um, some potential new changes to the tariff regime. Support with standards and guidelines and support for Eastern Indonesia, namely the Flores Geothermal Island project. <clears throat> SMI, the most of the support has been to the Waisano project, which is now complete, or our part of um, that, I should say the GeoWinds part of that is complete. Of course, Waisano is now um, being executed by GeoDepa. And we've also provided um, support to their pipeline projects and um, a few other things with um, general operations and, and manuals. Industry, we also provide support for or facilitate workshops and trainings and um, part of um, also that industry support is promoting women in the industry and encouraging them to, to get into geothermal, which is why we've been really happy to be involved with the women in geothermal. So with Balan Geology, um, our focus has been on exploring and evaluating lower temperature geothermal resources, reviewing um, primarily preliminary survey data, um, methodologies and processes, and energy estimates and classifications. Um, falling between EBTKE and Balan Geology is also on prioritisation methodology and support for slim hole drilling. So with Badang Geology, we've been collaborating with them now for about the last three years. Um, most of this work has been face-to-face -face in Bandung and with some field work also. Um, it's been very collaborative effort where we as a group go over survey results, look at analyses, identify gaps or any red flags, strengthen any weaknesses and bring all those components of the surveys and analyses together to develop really robust conceptual models. Most recently, we have been working on conceptual models um, and data from Flores Island. Um, and this has been in conjunction with doing um, quite a bit more MT work as well, um, or going over results, I should say, rather than and doing field work. Now, I'll just touch on um, Flores Geothermal Island, or Flogus as we call it. So um, we've been working with BG on the data for this and developing conceptual models. And, and from that estimating possible resource side. So when we um, come onto this prioritisation, which we've been doing as well, we're looking at many components of a geothermal prospect. We consider the completeness of the available data, consider the level of uncertainty, consider resource prospectivity, and then likelihood of discovering a presence of a useful resource after some exploration drilling. And then there's also the permitting side of things, land use, social, environmental impacts, um, additionally infrastructure requirements, <clears throat> if there's any roads nearby or is it roads up to the mountains, geohazards, and to a degree some commercial considerations. So at the moment um, we completed the resource inventory last year, um, very much a team effort with Balan Geology. We've had other reports in from other working groups, independent working groups on social environmental issues, economic development, um, and the energy demand, and what it's um, forecast, to, how it's forecast to grow, sort of optimistic scenarios, medium scenarios, um, low growth scenarios. From that, from those other reports, we then develop a supply um, report on how geothermal will fit into that um, energy demand. And then we add this to our resource inventory and then can prioritise which resources um, would best fit in, in the different criteria. Additional to that work, we've um, in the past year or two been helping them with the other resources that they've been looking at, the other surveys for these areas beyond not all in Flores. And again, going over their interpretations and refining assessments. Additionally, we've run a few workshops, um, some whole drilling workshop and the UNFC classification training, which I believe was also done at ITB. And um, some of the team attended the, went to the drilling in, on Pantea Island. We also um, did a deep dive into geochemistry and geophysics, and in particular, how these um, uh, interpretations and analysis, etc., relate to lower temperature resources as opposed to higher temperature resources, what the markers are for those different techniques and how they can be used or modified for different resources. And we also have installed the 
geodata management system and done quite a bit of training around that um, and the team in Budung Geology are using that. So our relationship and collaboration with BG we think has been really successful. The team really enjoy going to Bandung and, and working with the guys there at Bandung Geology and hopefully they enjoy us coming there as well. Um, so I think you know the whole team has grown and um, a broader understanding of project development um, not just from the survey side but how that feeds into exploration drilling and targeting and things like that and that, and that is an ongoing process as well and we hope to accomplish a lot more in the coming year. Um, COVID-19 of course has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works um, because obviously working face to face side by side um, is a lot more meaningful than um, via Zoom but um, yeah we've got to be optimistic and we will get back there soon hopefully. So coming on to lower temperature uh, resources, so historically um, development has been focused on high temperature and high enthalpy resources using conventional um, steam technology and more recently binary and hybrid plants. But low and medium temperature fields are common um, and um, with the more recent developments, particularly in Turkey, USA and in Europe, um, there have been a lot more and you can see the list there and, and I'm not sure if you can make out some of the temperatures but they're you know all below sort of 200 degrees. This map is a few years old but from these lower temperature resources is about a hundred uh, sorry a thousand megawatts being generated. A lot of these um, ones in the US and I think a few also in Turkey uh, have been developed by ORMAT and I will come on to them shortly. So as I mentioned there are abundant lower temperature resources worldwide including Indonesia and there's been estimates that 35% of the geothermal resources in Indonesia are lower temperature developments. These ones are being investigated by Badang Geology and um, these are some of the ones we've been looking at with them and so they have do have modest temperatures and so there is a higher degree of resource temperature uncertainty to them. Um, Going back to the, the worldwide development of lower temperature <clears throat> resources, so the introduction of binary plants over the last 35 years in the US has led to the development of several systems that were pumped and now have long operating histories and pumped meaning that they will not flow on their own because of their temperatures. So the number of, um, of these developments worldwide is approximately 10% of all global geothermal generation. And these generally um, target reservoirs or lower temperature reservoirs less than a thousand meters. So they are cheaper to drill, um, although generally it could be a larger diameter hole, um, not necessarily slim holes. Um, could be you know, full bore diameter um, as opposed to your standard um, diameter exploration um, production wells. So based on the, the, the fields that have been developed um, in the US and other parts of the world, they are technically and financially feasible and in some cases cheaper than conventional plants. Now I've just put a little asterisk here um, because some of this detail I've taken out of a paper that was presented at ITB a few years ago by my colleagues. So the settings for lower temperature resources um, are quite different. So we have hot sedimentary or naturally fractured aquifers and a variety of non-volcanic but mostly ideally high heat flow basinal settings. These are typically extensive in horizontal directions and can occur at any depth, but obviously deeper you go, the hotter it will be. These are structurally controlled systems that may also be in non-volcanic, but most ideally high heat flow settings. These can be structurally complex and associated with steeply dipping faults and fracture networks, bringing fluid that's been heated by deep circulation to shallower levels where they could be tapped by drilling into these fracture zones or perhaps into adjacent shallower aquifers being fed by the parent fault system. Examples of these systems, um, as you well know, occur along the Great Sumatran Fault System and are commonly associated with extensional bends and pull-apart basins. Then we have lateral outflows from geothermal systems developed on the flanks of central volcanoes. So some high temperature convecting geothermal systems have considerable hot fluid outflows at shallow levels, often with strong lithological influence, which is sometimes manifested as hot springs occurring kilometres away from the central volcanic edifice. Now 
with this paper I mentioned, they, um, Ridwan and others, did some modelling of pump wells in Indonesian conditions. And it showed that with reasonable productivity indices, so we're looking at moderate permeability of at least, say, 20 tonnes per hour per bar, it should be possible to achieve 4 to 9 megawatts per well over a resource range of 160 to 200 degrees. And these potential well capacities and potential for drilling shallower wells at a lower cost than indicate that would indicate that the pump systems may be cost competitive with similar sized high temperature projects. So if you consider shallower wells, perhaps easier access because you're not going up the side of a volcano into the jungle, there are a lot of cost savings there. However, there is further economic analysis would be warranted. So these findings indicate that lower temperature resources may be attractive targets from a technical standpoint for pumped well developments in Indonesia if they meet certain criteria, so the resource temperature over 160 and shallow artesian physiometric levels and or the ability to site well pads at lower elevations relative to the system hydrology. So moving on and with lower temperature resources in mind and collaboration with industry, which is one of the key activities in the GeoWinds program, um, we are planning to host some webinars shortly with ORMAT. This was planned for um, earlier in the year in March when we were going to be there. Um, I guess unfortunately that didn't happen, um, but we still want to do this and, and you know loads of um, the industry people are doing lots of webinars and, and getting a great audience. So in two weeks we're doing one called Doing Geothermal Differently, Lower Temperature Resources. And so here's an overview of the topics and we'll put more detail in once we put this all out on social media. So we're drawing on experts both from uh, ORMAT who have got sort of up to sort of 30, 40 years experience and experts from Jacob. So we're going to be looking at the development history of lower temperature fields, exploration methods for lower temperature fields and how they could differ from exploration methods for high temperature fields, well design and drilling, binary technology, geothermal pumps, downhole pumps, and technical field case studies. These field studies will be more of a deep dive into particular fields, so more technical, whereas the others are going to be more broad based. So if you're not maybe a new scientist or an engineer, you know that <clears throat> these other ones will have definite appeal. So just a bit of an overview here on ORMAT, which I'm sure you've heard about. So They've been operating for 50 plus years um, with a lot of their fields in the US, um, 630 megawatts of generation in the US, and we've got some in Central America and Kenya, and, um, and these are the ones that are, I believe are owner operated. So these binary, all map binary plants in many other places around the world as well, but these ones um, are, are their owner operated. So what have we got? 917 megawatts at 25 sites, of which they operate more than 140 pumped production wells. So the webinars, they're going to be open to everybody and anyone who wants to join in, so you are most welcome and tell your colleagues. Um, we will have you know, you'll be able to register for these and we're planning on doing, kicking off from the week of the 27th of August, I think. Wednesday, we're looking at about a Wednesday or Thursday, and these will be one hour weekly live webinars with a Q&A session, and we're aiming that for around 10 a.m. Indonesian time, and additional, as I mentioned, there'll be case study sessions, which may be on the same week, um, so there might be two webinars, but as I said, these ones will be a lot more technical, and we will be advertising these on social media in the coming days, so please keep an eye out, and we will... Um, obviously let you people know at ITB as well. Now these are going to be live sessions, they are not pre-recorded, so um, if you sleep in, you will miss it. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you very much again to ITB and the organisers for um, allowing me to present this webinar and um, hopefully we will all see each other sometime soon, maybe before the end of the year. Great, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jen Bordris, for your very good presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give her a round of applause. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a question and answer session for this invited uh, speaker session.
and then uh, <coughs> I would like to remind for the presenter that there will be a momento for you and your uh, team of authors as a token of appreciation. The committee will contact you regarding the shipping address. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, finally, we have finished with the last presenter of the day. We have learned a lot today regarding uh, some study cases of related to geothermal study from North Sumatra and the Central Java and the two invited uh, speakers. And then May, what we have learned today will be useful for us in the future. Thank you for speaker, thank you for presenter, and also for the attendee. Thank you very much. I return this to MC. Mbak Vita, please. Thank you, Bapak Mirzam, for guiding us throughout the technical session. Now, we are at the end of day three of the ninth ITB International Geothermal Workshop. At the moment, we would like to give our highest gratitude to Bapak Ricky Firmanda Ibrahim and Miss Jane Brotheridge all paper presenters, and also to all participants. We also would like to thank to our silver sponsors, PT Sustrako Adikreasi, PT Geodipa Energi, and to our bronze sponsors, PT Tunggal Buana Utama, PT Plumpang Raya Anugrah, PT Scientific Drilling, Star Energy Geothermal. And without forgetting our other sponsors, PT Pertamina Geothermal Energi, PT Supreme Energy, PT Sarana Multi Infrastruktur, PT Depriwanga, Kogindo Daya Bersama, Bank BNI, and PT Andalan Tunas Mandiri. This event also sponsored by International Geothermal Association, Indonesia Geothermal Association, Indonesian Association of Geologists. Many thanks also to our media partners who did a great job in announcing this event. Think Geo Energy, Geothermal Resource Council, Madrock Media, Panas Bumi News, Indonesia International Geothermal Convention and Exhibition, and Rambu Energy. We would like to remind you that tomorrow we still have one more session starting from 3 to 6 p.m. Jakarta time. In particular, for tomorrow agenda, there will be one invited speaker from Mr. Alfredo Battistelli, a geothermal reservoir engineer consultant, and five presenters with engineering topics. Kindly check your chat box to get the link for today's participation certificate. Due to the limitation of time, unfortunately, not all of the presentation can be brought to you during this event. However, other presentations are accessible for you to enjoy in our official website. You can access www.workshop.geothermal.itb.ac.id slash workshop 2020. And also in our YouTube channel, Geothermal ITB. So don't forget to subscribe. Eventually, this is the time for me to say goodbye. On behalf of the nine ITB International Geothermal Workshop Committee, thank you to all for making time in your busy schedules to join us here this afternoon. I am Nurfita Aprilina, your host for today, hoping to meet you in the near future. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>